note, for maximum picture quality, it may be necessary to adjust the tracking control on your VCR. Información Movistar. El móvil al que llama está apagado o fuera de cobertura en este momento. When it comes to the Spanish film industry, one name stands out, Pedro Almodóvar. Exploding onto the scene in post-Franco Spain, he brought a new language and acceptance of alternative lifestyles and a look that Spain would come to adopt as their own. When the society was experimenting, his abandonment to the idea of social transgression showed what possibility there was open to this new democracy. And in 1988, he makes Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, which brings him international acclaim and success, which is unparalleled in the Spanish film industry before. Introducing America to not only himself, but a whole host of actors that would go on to wild success during the 90s. Every Almodovar film is still an occasion, but this is Adjust Your Tracking, a podcast for on adventure to watch a century of cinema decade by decade, year by year. I am one half your host, Liam Delaney, and with me is... Hello, I'm Ollie Jones. Hello. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. It's a chilly late night record. Oh, it's not that. Yeah, late. summer's. But you can tell su- summer's nearly over. Summer so, is yeah. really over. Yeah, we had but, it for about a week and then it went away. Yes. And now it's gone. And now I'm just left with chills. And I've got a blanket. I'm, I'm podcasting with my blanket. Yeah, and we both live warm. in quite old houses, don't we? Yeah, I live in a house that barely has windows that fit the frame, so it's just basically <laughs> like wind that flies through every yeah, single m- Mine have acre. cracks either side of them, so you keep getting like a little draft on the side of your neck. <laughs> yes, yes, they're the ones. It's so nice. I've also got a little wine as well. That's have you got a little, little wine? I've got a little, a little water. Actually, no, I've got yeah. a big water. I've got a pint of water. I felt like um, in the spirit of the kind of this film, a, a rosé really matched. I thought, like, yeah, or one of those. What's it, they drink that fucking horrible looking tomato drink? <laughs> we'll we'll get to that. Like, soup. <laughs> so, oh god, whatever. We'll get to it later on. You not no man. No, we get to it now. Have you not no. had gazpacho? No, because I don't like. I've okay. I've got a really love hate. No, not love. I've got a a moderately like to hate relationship with tomato. So oh, really, so that like I can't I can't eat to. Well, do you eat to soup? I don't. I'm not a big fan of. Liquid in food form. So you don't really have soup anyway, then? I hate soup. Oh, um, I like yeah, soup. I'm not a fan of soup. Uh, I don't really like stew either. Um, wow. Wow. <laughs> doing a, a doughboy as well there. Wow. So, but tomato especially, like, I'll have a tomato, but I have to take the inside out, the, the, you know, the, the kind of the, what? the gooey... The, do you mean the food? The bit yeah, of it? Yeah, like, it's just... I, it just I don't know, like tomato just has a flavour for me that just But I have tomato ketchup and stuff like that and I'll have tomato on pizza. So um, like I said, it's a weird relationship, but like that drink that they have or soup as you said it was. Just <laughs> having that as like just Don't say it like I'm lying to you. It made my skin crawl. I'm not even joking. <laughs> really? So like I would be the only person in this film that wasn't passed out. <laughs> wasn't out. passed out. <laughs> Oh god, my old Spanish housemate used to make gazpacho all the time and it was the best thing and she never would tell me the like the um <laughs> the recipe or anything like and I bet it was really simple but she never would tell me what it is and when she, she was making like a gazpacho in this like chopping those tomatoes I was just like oh I'm so hungry. <laughs> this is like really but really The reason working. why I say a drink and you say it's a soup but they're like they have it like a drink so you you know what I mean? Well, I it's, guess so. Yeah, I guess they I don't know. I guess because it's cold, you can just easily just drink it like that. Whereas oh, that makes have... it even worse. That honestly, that makes my skin crawl even more. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go to like a bonfire night, you don't get like a cup of soup from like no, the soup definitely people. not. <laughs> I That's get a, thing, a goldfish it? like most people do. <laughs> and drink an apple. That. I hate apples covered in toffee. That's my that's my gazpacho, uh, Ollie. Well, I, I like toffee and I like apples, but putting together is a recipe it's for disaster. <laughs> it's horrible. And they're always like apples that taste like chalk and then like toffee that's like so tough it breaks your teeth. Well, they probably use fucking cooking apples or whatever that are so yeah, tart yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Like, 
anyway, how are you? I'm all right. I'm a little bit, I wouldn't say stressed, but a bit anxious. So I came back from Leeds, yep. Leeds. last week after, you know, working on a stop motion film. Um, and uh, the guy I was working with finally had his baby. So I, I got to, it's got to go home. Um, oh, <laughs> you meant I got to see the baby. <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, I just came back to my office and like everything is in my office. So all my equipment, all my Blu-rays, all my DVDs. Right. I have lots of supplies, so lots of plasticine. I also have lots of toys. So there's lots of things <laughs> everywhere. And I started to do some work the other day and I just couldn't concentrate. There's just so much stuff everywhere. Yeah, so right, been, okay. I like I've got comics. Like I don't know. I was talking to you about it the day. Yeah. I'm just going to sell all my comics because they're just there. They're not. It's like visual <laughs> noise everywhere. It's just. Yeah, 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 yeah. Doing any? It's just stuff. So I've been doing a mad eBay thing of trying to sell all my, not all my stuff, oh. but like a lot of stuff, just trying to thin it out a bit and kind of. Oh wow. Cur- curate it a bit. And, sure. Um, like you know, it's, it's that. What's that thing they say that you, the things that you own end up start owning you? That kind of thing. I've never heard yeah. that. I thought you were going to do the Marie Condi thing. Whatever. What's that? <laughs> what is it? it ha- you have to, if it doesn't spark joy, that's what she well, yeah, says, it that, has to spark joy. Well, yeah, if your things that you enjoy start to cause you like, anxiety, then, you know, yeah. you know, things are going to change. So luckily, though, today I finally sold my copy of Star Wars Jedi Power Battles, which I've been trying to get rid of for a long time. So that's, <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> do you not remember playing that game? It's a terrible PlayStation 1 game. Oh, Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, I didn't know I, that. I, was a, got, I didn't know that what it, what it was called. I've got this box of about 150 DVDs that are DVDs I just don't want, or I've got Blu-rays of, so you know I don't need extra ones of them. And yeah. I've been trying to get rid of them for ages, but no one takes them anymore. It's like VHSs back in the day; people just stopped taking right. them because yeah, they just yeah, can't yeah. get rid of them anymore. So I've I've just been carting around this box of DVDs for ages, and it's like. <laughs> It's almost like a weight on me now. It's like it's dragging, like it's it's pulling me back, holding me back now. It's like a weight on my shoulders. Box of fucking DVDs. I've got. Um, I've been trying to clear out stuff as well, and mainly books. I have so many books, um, and I've I've filled up three bags for life of books. Wow! And I don't know what to do with them. They just they they now live under my bed, <laughs> like. And I just don't know where to give them or what to do with them. Or I don't want to. I don't even care about selling them. Like I'll just give them to someone. Like if there's a library or something, someone just take them. I don't like. Like I just want them away from my life. I don't care. And you know, you know, like uh, Netflix and Amazon and that have kind of like taken over like DVD sales and stuff like that. Yeah. Has like eBooks and audio books taken over physical books, or are they still? I don't more think popular? so. To be honest, I, I mean, like. I still find myself buying, I still find myself buying books when I need them, and then yeah. and then kind of buying like an ebook when I want to read it or something. Like, yeah, it's like if I'm just going on a train and I want a new book, I just download my ebook on my Kindle. But most of the time, if a new book's coming through, I'm buying it on paperback for some reason, and I don't really, I don't really know why I don't really collect stuff in that way. I just mm-hmm. seem to, I seem to have not completely moved over digital with books for some reason. I think it's really harder to flick through them and stuff. I think that's the thing. Especially, like, most of my books are reference stuff, so it's all, like, right, yeah. archaeology books. And and it's I find it really hard to kind of flick through them and, and scan for what I need when it's all digital. Even though, I mean, saying that, I've got thousands of digital, like, reports and stuff like that, like PDF and things, so I don't know. Like, books, books, books are kind of lasting for some reason, aren't they? Yeah, see, I wish I was someone like... Brandon, like Brit- Brandon, just has a MacBook and that's it, like nothing else. He's probably got like three pairs of clothes and that's it. He probably has more, than that. but like, but like, I have stuff and it just it's starting to annoy me now. It's starting like to I've, drag you down. Like I've got all my video games from when we were kids. You know, I can. Yeah. I'm looking at F Zero X now. Why do I still own F Zero X? <laughs> I mean, it's a good game, but like, I probably haven't put it used it in about twenty years. I think all my video games. And consoles are at my parents' house. Um, they haven't travelled with me, but I'd be you kind of make upset a if they were I know. I kind of like that they exist. Like I like kind of little bits of technology and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I would find it hard to kind of. I guess I could go through the games actually and get rid of just you know things that don't bring me any kind of nostalgia. But there's going to be like some of them that I wouldn't like to part with. I bet. Yeah. 
not like my kind of I've got like my Xbox 360 here and frankly that can go <laughs> like <laughs> although it's got a Skyrim save game on it that I wouldn't like to go so maybe that has to stay <laughs> but you played that on the PC though didn't you yeah, 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 yeah. It's just it's a specific save game from when I was playing it on the 360 when I lived in Qatar. That's all. Fair enough. Like, so it's got so some it's, memories involved. It's in got that. some memories, yeah. Ooh. So what else have you been up to? I, it was bank holiday and I did nothing. Oh, I'll tell you what I did on my bank holiday yesterday. I did a very grown-up thing. Did you? I bought a car. What? What? Yeah. I wouldn't say it's a new car, it's from 2016, but I got a new Corsa, but it's automatic, because Caroline's Ooh. finally started to learn. Okay. And she's she's learning an automatic, so we thought we may as well get an automatic now, so when she's passed, she can use it, and I'm going to you know, get used to using an automatic, because I've just used manual, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. But the car well, is from fun. 2016, but it's only done 3,000 miles, which is insane. What? And it looked, yeah, the quality is, it's such a nice car. So, like, we found it online and we're like, right, we're going up to Stoke on Trent right now. So, we bombed and it, up there it. And, just, and just got awesome. the car. Awesome. I saw felt very grown up. I think that's the most grown up thing aside from getting married that I've done. I think. <laughs> I think. When I bought my car, it was like, it was like an ex kind of lease thing. And again, it had like no miles on it. It had something like 7,000 miles on it, I think. And it, for, it had been leased for three years. And, um, I just bought it like outright as well. I was just like, here's the money. Here's the money from the car I totaled. <laughs> here's some savings I have. Just just take it. And I want to own this. I don't want to like, I don't want to sign any contracts. I don't want like any kind of lease. I just, I want this thing and I'm going to run it into the ground <laughs> until it can't move anymore. And then I'm going to get another one. <laughs> and that's my whole plan. <laughs> but like people, everyone nowadays, I seem to like my housemate was talking about that. She just got a new car as well. And I'm like, why is everyone getting cars? What do I, it's what weird as well because apparently car prices are up now as well. So I don't know why people are getting cars now, myself included. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fair, you might, need, you kind of need one. Well, I do. Like my, like my other course, are like she died. Like boring story, the head gasket went. So like all water's like leaking into all my oil. So you get this like, that's not good. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> that's as much as I know. Yeah, but it goes bumpy, a, doesn't it? Is that what happens? It, it goes bumpy. What do you mean? The car goes bumpy. Oh, like you're, dri- like no, you're driving on a bumpy that. road. No, I, I mean, it could do if I let it go really bad. But uh, basically, my dad's got another Corsa, so he's just going to strip that Corsa for parts. Like <laughs> Why are you the Corsa family? I don't Why know. I, I don't know what, like, it's a common problem, this... Um, this engine problem as well. So why would oh, we keep it? buying cool? So why keep getting more? Fool me once. <laughs> fool me twice. <laughs> fool me thrice. Okay. <laughs> can't get fooled again. Can't fool a, can't fool a fool. I would never, <laughs> ever stop thinking of George Bush doing that. Ever. <laughs> That's amazing. That was. <laughs> It's, I think it dates me more than anything else in the world that I still, for some reason, that's lodged in my brain permanently oh. of that quote of George Bush. Good old W. And in celebration back, of back w, when everyone hated W, and then <laughs> then they went right back around and said, "No, he wasn't that bad. He wasn't that, that bad. He bad. paints nice pictures. He might be a war criminal, but he paints <laughs> yeah, nice yeah. pictures, and he's kind of funny." <laughs> it's the, when he found about? out about nine eleven, and he's just reading storybooks with the little kids, <laughs> and he just carries on doing it. I'm thinking, what? It's not he's not, not his greatest moment. It's not no. really his fault, I guess, <laughs> where he was. You think you'd may just I think I probably should go now. Maybe but, maybe I need to leave. Yeah. <laughs> the end. The end. Bye. Close the book. Bye everybody. God, that's gonna be twenty years in a few like two weeks' time. That's what, nine eleven? Yeah. Uh, have you got any celebrations planned? <laughs> 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 like a new cake, or a new cake. <laughs> with towers on it. No, no. no. I okay. might watch. I could watch the Spider-Man trailer. Yeah, that'd the be one because there was wasn't there like sequences in the film with with the two towers that got completely cut out of the film. I think, and was I think they. That... Are, it's weird how they they decide to digitally erase it out of films. I find that quite bizarre. Yeah, it's a know. weird choice. It's a very yeah. weird choice. It's a very. Um, a country grieving choice, I think. Yeah, really, like we're now yeah. not seeing this. Wasn't it just the fact that was it that there was a poster that he had like a spider's web between them, 
Well, no, there and, was a whole trailer where and he was catches there a sequence a, where he, yeah, he catches, yeah, he catches, like catches a helicopter. them in the web in between the two towers. Yeah. They should have just left it. Uh, Spider Man trailer. Did you watch the Spider Man trailer? Yes. What did you think of it? I thought it was boring. <laughs> <laughs> I just can we not have a Spider Man film where it's just Spider Man swinging through <laughs> New York and then catching criminals? That's all I want, it, really. Just the. I mean, I'm excited. To, it feels like what well, I think. Oh, blah, 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 blah. I think Karen Hahn t- tweeted this out, which is what I was stumbling over. But she basically just said that, like. Disney seemed to think everyone's really excited about this trailer because they love multiverses, but actually it's just because Spider-Man 2 is the best film ever. <laughs> like, <laughs> and that is true. Like, No one's like, oh my God, I can't wait to see them all interact. It's like, oh my God, I loved Spider-Man 2. Like, yeah. That's really like... And Spider-Man 2 was really good because it was a Spider-Man film about Spider-Man and it had Spider-Man villains in it doing Spider-Man things in New York and it wasn't some bullshit <laughs> that they keep doing with the Marvel Spider-Man. Which I seem to be getting more angry about as the days go by, actually. I was talking about it the other day, realising how annoyed I am at like, Spider-Man's presentation in the new stuff. Apparently Electro's back in it, but it's not like he was a beloved character that everyone loved. Like, oh. Alfred oh, Molina cool. like, is still like considered one of the greatest comic book villains. Like, yeah. And that film's like nearly 20 years old. Nearly 20 years old, yeah. And it's still kind of the most... They're, they're, so much so they're not even thinking of touching Doc Ock as a character because he... He was so iconic in it, mm-hmm. and, and that's not Electro. That's it's not. Or is is Paul Giamatti going to be in as Rhino? Oh, it's the Russian <laughs> Rhino. That would be good. Well, I think the lizard's supposed to be in it. You know, the Riff Irons character. Oh my god! Yeah, um, I don't I even s- remember Amazing Spider-Man Two. I really don't remember that film. At the all. whole silly backstory they had that his mom and dad were like spies and stuff. I think they, yeah, they've they, done that before in the comics, but no one ever It really is a comic that. story, yeah. But yeah. no one ever liked that version of it. No, because no one likes stories that are just about your parents. Like, but like, come on. the whole point of Spider-Man is he's just a normal boy who just so happens to accidentally get these powers. And in this film, they kind of have it that his parents were like testing on spiders and yeah. they were his parents. It's like It was kind of like destined that he was going to become the Spider-Man and stuff like that. And it's like, no. It's as, it's as bad as don't... what if Spider-Man was just a billionaire's ward? And got given yeah. a load of stuff. <laughs> what would yeah. that be like, Spider Man? It would be boring. Yep. That's what it would be. <laughs> and I, I've said this to you before, but I hate it when Spider Man just stands there and his suit automatically like appears on Does him, like, shit. you know, nanotech. Right, yeah. Oh no, no, just he needs just a spandex suit. That's I hate it. it. That's Is it spandex? Yeah. Whatever, lycra, I don't know. Anything. He needs PVC. a hoodie and some joggers, <laughs> frankly. Like it's Spider Man. Like he doesn't yeah. need anything else. <laughs> It's really, I, it just, it just annoys me. It, it just seems like it's going to get worse. And I think we've talked about it before. Frankly, we've said all this before. I think. Yeah. Because like, do you remember the first Amazing Spider-Man? And he had this weird suit on that it looked like a basketball. It was just such a weird looking rubber <laughs> no, suit. I don't. And then, then when the sequel came around, they were like, "Oh, let's just make it like the Tobey Maguire ones." And it, it was basically like the Tobey Maguire suit. But um. Have, do you think Tobey Maguire and Garfield will be in this? I think they kind of got to put them in, haven't they? It'd be really, dis- it'd be really weird if they don't at this point. And I think people do take against it. Well, I think but the thing is that the whole of the internet have have decided they're in it. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, if they're not in it, like that's ooh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That. They're, they're like, kind of le- hiding it is not going to be a surprise for anyone. It's only going to lead to bad things if it doesn't happen. At least with the Flash, they were like completely up front and going, "Yep, yeah, Michael Keaton's in this <laughs> as Batman," and so, so you know, but, uh, yeah. But it was just the same. Like we were saying about the kind of the, that shot of Alfred Molina, it just looks so boring. Like just, oh. just him on a grey, smoky background, and it just looks like every other boring kind of composition of shots and. And presentation that Marvel do just really just it, bog standard and dull. Like. Well, it just looked like it's shot on a back lot in Atlanta, yeah, yeah. and his face has been smeared over with CGI to make it look younger. For some younger. reason, yeah, and just like his costume was ace in the first one, and like, he just had a big yeah. rain mac on, didn't he? Like over, yeah, his, yeah, like, yeah, bandages and stuff like that. And obviously, he's not going to be like that now, but um, but just just see like, but he see looks the... younger now than this than he did in the. Yeah, first film. I think. <laughs> they made him look younger. <laughs> yeah, 
But like the, you see, like the composition of shots Raimi used in like Spider Man Two and how they yeah, introduced him. Yeah, but we know he's stuff, a master and... of camera work, isn't yeah. he? But like just that inventiveness, you just if you're going to bring like you know Alfred Molina's Doc Ock into it, then you have to bring that creativity into it. You've got to bring that visual good. aesthetic into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, that aesthetic. Yeah. You know, it's, it, exactly. It's Spider Man Two. People miss not Doctor Ock. It's Spider Man Two. You know, like. <laughs> But I don't know. We'll see. Hopefully, it's good. I keep saying that about everything, but I did. I found, I, I read somewhere that you know, like the MJ in this is like not Mary Jane. She's Michelle or something like that. Apparently, okay, that's I a whole know. clause between Disney and Sony that it can't be the normal Mary huh. Jane. Every, and like his best friend can't be Harry. It has to be a n- new character and stuff like that. So I think. Sony technically then own those characters like that MJ and Ned as opposed. Do you know what I mean? I think there's some weird clause. Oh, right, That's why okay. they've created these new characters, and they weren't allowed to use like traditional MJ and stuff. But I don't know. Could be that totally is, wrong. But yeah, that whole it there's is a, a lot weird of choice though that she's Sony. not. Co- You're sorry. There is a lot of weird conspiracies about Sony and the the kind of how the deal works and stuff like that. I was. Yesterday there was loads of like rumors that Disney are going to try and buy Sony Pictures just to get. Oh, Spider-Man, I read that. I read that. I was like, d- I don't think that's going to happen. Nah, <laughs> that think... won't happen. <laughs> that sounds a bit outlandish to me. I mean, if that happened, there would literally be two big studios, and that would be Disney yeah. and Warner Brothers. I think maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe Paramount. That would but... be it. Yeah. Oh, Universal as well. Where's... So there'd be like Universal. Four. Yeah, yeah. Because Sony own Columbia, don't they? And all the stuff that came with Columbia. Yeah. But that's it, I think. I think Coke I used to own anything. Columbia first, and that's why, like, yeah, like they Ghostbusters did. and that, there's, like, Coke everywhere and stuff like that in the film. That Coke deal's really funny that, like, I think it's... Is it is it Ishtar or is it another film? There's one film, basically, they decided to green light, and it was Coke who decided to green light it and pushed, like, the most money into it ever. And it, and that's what almost bankrupt them because you know they <laughs> the CEOs don't run fucking studios they run like a Coke company so to the idea that they, these like I don't know these eighties kind of frat boys running Coke decided they could just easy run a picture company is quite funny to me and apparently they properly ballsed it up but it's also why a ton of stuff from those early Columbia isn't available on uh, Blu-rays and stuff because the copyright's weird and the trademark oh, okay. is all weird. Because it just gets messy when something gets handed around constantly like that, and I think right. I think um, it's one of Elaine May's film, Heartbreak Kid. I think is one of the films that is weirdly mixed up in that trademark stuff, and it's not available for print because of it. And it's like fuck oh, off, okay. Coke. Just let let Criterion publish it. <laughs> interesting, interesting. So, uh, have you been watching anything recently? Yeah, I guess I've been watching quite a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of stuff. New releases, new releases time. I've been watching some new releases. That's really low yeah, energy watched. for me. <laughs> new releases. <laughs> <laughs> new release. I'm so excited. <laughs> so excited. Uh, yeah, spoiler, war- spoiler warning for new releases. Um, I watched Stillwater. I'm starring Matthew Damon. Oh, yeah. Um, Matthew Damon. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Damon <laughs> and Abigail Breslin, who gets her proper name apparently. Uh, you know, she's it's the, the girl from Zombieland and Little yeah. Miss Sunshine. Yeah, 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 yeah. I actually didn't know it was the person from Little Miss Sunshine, and it surprised me when I found that out. Uh, she's really, really good actually in it. Um, still, yeah. was pretty good. Uh, it's, I, I mean, I, I quite like Tom McCarthy. I think because I really, really like Spotlight quite a lot that year. It's one of my favourites of that year. And this is the last next time he's made anything, I think, since then. I think it is. Wasn't wasn't the band in Almost Famous called Stillwater? I don't but remember. The, yeah, the fake like Led Zeppelin like yeah. band with yeah Billy Kudrup and that. Was it Billy Kudrup? I think so. It's been a while since I've seen that film. Ow, my back hurts. But yeah, you recommend <laughs> Stillwater then? Yeah, it's really good. You know, it's the Amanda Knox story basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And. Uh, and it is, but it isn't. But they clearly have not taken enough effort to actually make it unique. Like more, right, they've, okay. transpl- they've transplanted it to Marseille rather than it being uh, wherever it was in Italy, Nepal, Nepal, or something. Nepal, blah, Nepal- blah, blah. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and it, yeah, it's basically it's it's the poster makes it look like it's going to be a movie about Matt Damon working on like a rig, but it's him in Marseille as like a very like middle American kind of man 
trying to navigate the cultural differences of Marseille to try and get his kid out of prison. And it takes some swings in that film that I don't like and, and kind of lost me. And it's a little long, but actually when it, I kind of found myself really enjoying it and I'm really, really quite liking it actually. I think it's really good. I, I think it did is. Did you really watch good. the documentary on Netflix about Amanda Knox? <laughs> I did, yeah, 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 yeah I did. Yeah. The Amanda Knox story kind of fascinates me because oh, yeah. she she basically did nothing wrong. It's ridiculous. And it's just because she liked to have sex and the Italians were just like, oh my God, like, what's this demon? But in um, terms of like a, a, a well, it was like a well-made documentary and like the, it like, was, yeah. the, the Madeleine McCann one, which I think was like 11 episodes and like, mm. you know, you learned nothing that you didn't know. I forgot, know. I, like, I forgot that happened. Yeah. I remember me and so Caroline long. were watching it. We're like, oh my, why is this so long? You can tell it was like meant to be a two hour film. They're like, nah, make it. Make nah, it make 10 it episodes. 10 episodes and, and have no conclusion. It's well, because really there is no pay conclusion. Because there is no conclusion to this. Uh, I also watched Coda. Um, oh, yeah. C- C-O-D-A, uh, which is awesome. Fucking awesome. Uh, I, I watched it because I got a free thingy to uh, Apple TV. Apple TV Plus, whatever it's called. Apple Plus, whatever they're calling themselves. Oh, this is the one um, about the girl who's got deaf, deaf family. Yeah, so CODA stands for Child of Deaf Adults. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like she's the only person from a family of um, uh, deaf adults who's hearing. And um, and it's uh, Emily Jones. Amelia Jones, sorry, is the main actress. And she learnt sign language for the role, which I think is fucking awesome. And the way she kind of um, acts and presents and talks, it feels, to me, and I know I don't speak sign language, but... Um, to me like it felt really naturalistic and really normal for her to be doing that like it felt like she'd really found that role and did a really good job of it I would be very surprised if she doesn't get some awards nomination because of that um, just because she managed to really embody that role um, I should and... watch this because I've because I've, I got a new iPhone the other the week I got like a, a subscription to yeah yeah definitely TV, definitely, so I definitely. Get on it and uh, the rest of the family are all deaf actors as well, which wasn't like that when this is a remake of a French film. It wasn't like that in the French film either. And um, oh, okay. they are fucking awesome. Like Marley, uh, Marley Matin, Matlin, Marley Matlin. She was nominated for, an, like, she's the only deaf actress ever to uh, win the Best Actress Oscar so far. She won it for, um, years ago for, uh, God, what was it? I can't remember. It's gone out of my head. Chil- Children of a Lesser God. Um, and uh, I think she she's going to be up for a nomination. I think I could see her getting it for this. But the premise um, sounds it's like fascinating. So it's like a young girl who is the only one who can hear in a family. But she like, she she decided, she, you know, she realised she likes to sing. Is that right? Yeah, or it is, she... totally. She likes, yeah. she likes to sing, yeah. And, you know, the kind of one, the big anxiety of the whole film is... Um, one her parents kind of or especially her mom treating like, her like her well her, treating her wanting to sing as like an act of rebellion against yeah. them because they can't hear yeah. like and and almost treating it like uh she's doing it purposely despite them and um the dad's more like the dad's worried that he has no idea if she's good because he can't yeah that would make you that would like, that'd be heartbreaking so it's like I don't want my kid to embarrass herself and not be good at this, you know, to to get going forward. Yeah. Um, it's and then you got the brother as well, who's actually aged up for this. Uh, he's younger in the French film, um, and his kind of his part of that is that like he's the older brother, but because she's the kind of hearing child, she gets all the kind of um, she gets all the uh, what's the word like responsibility pushed onto, and he kind of gets like belittled and kind of right. ignored uh, because because he's deaf even like by his family because you know they've got like someone else who can communicate to the hearing world kind of thing so you get all these kind of really really unique and interesting kind of like social family structures which I haven't seen play out in films before so I was just kind of fascinated by it all and um, the really good performance as well by uh, he's like an, he's a Mexican actor. I'm sure if you know Mexican or Spanish language stuff, you know him. But I've never seen him before. Uh, Eugenio Eugenio de Bez, de Bez, de Bez. Yeah. Um He's so good as a music teacher in this. He he brings such energy to it and um, and kind of um, pathos and stuff like that. He's like one of those really good teacher roles. You know when actors really just dig into a teacher role. He's done it so well. Um, and I just think it worked. 
it worked amazingly. I couldn't believe, kind of couldn't believe how much I was actually just falling in love with the film, frankly. And there's there's two bits in it that I won't spoil properly, but it's there's one bit in um, the gig scene, and then just after the gig scene, there's a quiet scene between her and her father, and both those scenes broke me in ways that like I was just like I couldn't believe how much it was having an emotional effect on me really. Um, so I on, honestly, Coda's great, and so watch that, Coda. Like, so that actor, the Derbe, you know, Eugenio Derbez, he yeah. um, he does a lot of. A voiceover, Spanish Latin voiceover yeah. for the film. Yeah. So that's got a nice connection to today's. It film. does, doesn't it? <laughs> they did uh, Joanne Krauss in in Hellboy, which I think was voiced by the Family Guy. Oh uh, yeah, right. Guy in the original one, and he did like a lot of he did Donkey and Sh- in the Shrek movies and stuff like that. So it's quite. Yeah, I wonder seems- if I've always wondered in like foreign movies. So say if like, is there an Eddie Murphy voice in like? In yeah, French. There is it's the same actor every time. It's I can't. I can't say Murphy. every location, but I was going to say this later when we talk about dubbing because I've got a friend who lives in Austria, and um, they they watch all the German dubbing like of Hollywood films that, and they're used to watching it. That's how they grew up. That's how they watch the cartoons. That's how they watch movies. They're just used to watching it that way. But does their Tom um, Cruise always mostly sound the same? It's always the same. Yeah, there's. Scenes. It's not always like that yeah. but there are the actors that commonly do various actors and commonly do so various roles ever, and stuff like that as well if, if they ever do impressions of tom cruise over there is, do they do, they do it of that <laughs> guy like i find that yeah. quite fascinating <laughs> i find we it amazing find it's out. a whole world need- that i just don't know anything about you know it's a whole yeah. different thing and like to my ears it's like sacrilege to watch like a dubbed film but for some people it's oh, like yeah. well i I don't, I don't want to watch every Tom Cruise film in subtitles. I just want to sit down and watch an action film, you know? Like, and the dubbing's pretty good now. They get the rhythm's quite good. So mm-hmm. I get I kind of get the kind of temptation for people to do that. It makes sense, you know? The the thing I used to hate was with, like, anime and stuff. Like, like if I remember the original Akira, the original dub that they did for that, like, almost changed the yeah. plot. And <laughs> changed it like, everything, yeah. Why? <laughs> There's a lot of those with some of the earlier Ghiblis as well, before the kind of kind of... Ghibli took control of it with Disney and a lot of the early ones really did mess around with it a lot like and it's like what what are you doing why do you think you can improve this it's just it's like it's these people have got an idota of power to have a creative input kind of go loose go wild on stuff as well it's like that with we right. we did we'd um Satoshi Kon didn't we and Tokyo Godfathers had just it was last year it came out they re-released a new dub for it because the original dub in English was really kind of transphobic and really kind of horrible. Oh, really? Like a, lot, a lot of the language was really um, quite... Um, like just just, was, just ruined the film, frankly. And, um, and it actually wasn't in the original script. They translated like words, like the Japanese words for like queen, like a drag queen type thing. And they would translate to the F slur and stuff like that. Oh. Um, and and things like that. It's like, why are you doing this? Like, w- like this is ridiculous. And it's not even what the script was doing. The script has much more fondness for these characters than the dubbing does. <laughs> like, clearly, whoever was in charge of that has no fondness for these people. But, you know, Satoshi Kon did. So they've redone all that kind of dubbing and the subtitling as well. It's the same thing. The subtitling was translating it really weirdly as well. Which is okay. kind of cool that they've bothered to redo it. I think. No, that is good. Yeah. And also, one last new re- new release. Um, yeah. Annette. Oh, the uh, musical one. The musical uh, star. Uh, it's Leo. The I Sparks musical. Name. Yeah, I. They're everywhere I'm, at the moment. Sparks are. It's like they've had a, like a resurgence, haven't they? They have. I don't really know anything about the Sparks at all, apart from what they look like and <laughs> that that song. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I know about them. <laughs> do, 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 do. That's all I know about Sparks. When I put Annette on, <laughs> and at my heart, I didn't know it was Sparks Opera. Okay. I had no idea. I knew it was a musical. I had no idea it was a Sparks Opera. And then the opening opens with Sparks in a recording studio playing this song and i was like what the fuck are sparks doing there <laughs> like, like when i was like, younger the- i used to think it was john waters honestly in that band because <laughs> they've both got that little thin little especially the keyboardist yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. little mustache and uh, the glasses. A little mustache and tiny glasses he was the most like british kind of californian that's ever existed yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I couldn't believe when they showed up. And the opening song to Annette is such a banger. It's so good. It's like, it's, it's, if is that it should get all the or is it there? Yeah, or I think is it's, it... as far as I know, and I haven't done enough research into Annette. However, there's an, a podcast episode of, um, can you, cans you kick it? The podcast, cans you kick it? Um, who just an episode on Annette. Uh, which is like two and a half hours long. So I recommend listening to that over my little ramblings. But um, uh, as far as I know, it was written as an opera for Sparks to do on stage. And at oh, okay. some point in the line, like Leo, Leo Carac, Leo's Carac, I don't know how to say his name, French filmmaker, somehow he got his whole like hands on it and they crafted it into, a, um, into, the, into the film. And the film itself opens as like a... It's very fourth wall breaking all the way through. It presents itself as like a stage show, really, is the best way to put it. Um, and brings you into a world that they know they're telling you a story rather than they're pretending it's reality, if that makes okay, sense, which yeah, helps yeah. because it helps because the opera is so operatic. The music is so operatic. The conversations are the presentation of it, staging everything is is presented in that way i i think a lot of people will find it alienating in that way because it's not it's not trying to be easy to you you know it's trying it's 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 being a little difficult but it's absolutely captivating i was just i was enthralled with every bit of it you know and some bits don't work but some of the look of it some of the some of the set pieces some of the music like i had no idea one of the characters was going to be a puppet that surprised me. Okay, I'm sold. <laughs> I'm 100% that, sold. I was like, what is this? Like, And Adam Driver is remarkable. He's just like, an amazing actor. Like, he there's holds no those doubt. Star Wars films on his shoulders. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's no doubt he's, like, best of this generation. Like, oh, yeah. kind of thing. Like, he's... he's And to watch him in this and all the singing he does in this and all the emoting and the singing and everything else like that, it's so good. I will... I will Annette has not gone out of my brain since I watched it, and I will I will watch it again. It finished, and I kind of wanted to watch it again, frankly. Like even I'm though watch I watch this for next week, I've decided it, is... she should definitely. Even though, like, I can understand any detractors. It's a weird film and is very long. I can un- and some of the songs are weird, but some of the songs in it have really sunk into me, and I just think that's a great. I can't believe someone's made this. It's so good that this exists, kind of thing. Yeah, but we're like... two people who used to rock out to Juju and stuff, so we're used to kind <laughs> of just music that's a bit challenging and stuff. And like, yeah, yeah, it's good. I, I really recommend it. I really, really enjoyed it. Like, I did. Anyway, I blabbled on enough. Any any films you watched? <laughs> uh, I I honestly haven't watched any. Well, I watched one newish film, which was absolutely terrible. So just to everyone to avoid this film, it's called. Things Heard and Seen, and it stars uh, Amanda yeah. Siegfried. Oh, and, yeah. um, it's just a, a haunted house kind of film, pretty much. But it's... Oh, God. Basically, it's <laughs> in this house, it's haunted by, like, the past occupants. Okay. But... so And the, the females have always been killed by their spouse, like, their husbands or whatever. And the husbands, somehow, each one kind of if I'm getting it right, they kind of... I'm, I'm kind of spoiling it now, but they kind of... Pos- not possess, but they they kind of influence the next gen- the next male in the house. To- they're normally a shit person anyway, but they just kind of graft on to like, the, the bad person in the relationship and kind of make them worse. But then the okay. females try and help the other female, the, the living female, if that makes sense. Okay. But it, it was absolutely terrible especially by the end it just got terrible um well, I, watched, I, watched I, just a, watched... I watched a ghost i watched a ghost haunted house film this week i just yeah. wanted to quickly say um burnt offerings from 1976 oh, yeah. uh it's got um oliver reed and burgess yes. meredith and betty yes. davis in it like what and karen black's the lead Ollie, it's so good. It's so good. Like, and it's an absolute like it's a PG haunted house film. It really is. Like, you could show it. Like, it's just kind of spooky and scary. It's so fucking good. And I, I was, I was enthralled by every second of it. And basically, like, like um, the house is kind of like alive, and it repairs itself on like the blood of the people that come stay in nice. it. Basically, it's and I watch watch burnt offerings. It rules. <laughs> <laughs> Right. As a haunted uh, house um, suggestion. 
Um, I've just rewatched a few things just because, like, like I said, I just came back from that job last week, and I just kind of didn't really want to do much. So I just kind of, as I was doing some like, m- the one thing I tend to do when I'm unwinding after doing a big job is like I do some sculpting, but it's a weird kind oh, yeah. of like just. So I made some like models and stuff, and I just watched some films when I was doing that. So I watched uh, California Man, as you do, Bird A, um, or good. Encino Man as American Encino Man. Yeah. Um, which I still find that film quite funny, but I think yeah, I think it holds up. I've I've noticed a lot of the films I've watched have this. They they all use the the f word as I mean like the slur f word, which is a bit unfortunate. Mm. Um, you know, like how Bill and Ted did and stuff like that. Yeah, um, yeah. So I could watch Basketball, and I think they do it in that as well. Um, I bet they do in basketball. Um, <laughs> and then the one that really made me quite sad that they do it in, and because I actually quite like this film, it's called The Girl Next Door, about the young lad oh, who kind of yeah. gets with the porn star. But they again, they Is use that the Paul Emil Dano Hirsch, in that? yeah, and Paul Dano, yeah, yeah. Um, and they use the f word in that as well. And I was like, oh come on, guys, you're better than come this. Because it's quite a sweet little film, really. <laughs> but then they yeah, do that. Is, yeah. But then oh. Uh, one film I haven't watched in about 20 years was Pump Up the Volume. I don't know if you've seen that film. Oh, years ago. I saw that on VHS, but, um, I think. But yeah, With, um, um, it, Christian Slater. Christian Slater, and he kind of he he starts up his own like pirate radio station. Well, not a yes, radio station. It, he just yeah. has a show that's on like 10 o'clock every night for an hour, and he kind of becomes a voice for this like school. For the generation, kind of, yeah. Yeah, but this school have got a kind of a lot of... Um, what do you call it? Like, uh, what's the word? Corruption in the school. Like, you know, they're kicking out students who have bad grades and stuff like that. And he's kind of exposing them. Like, not a lot happens mm. in the film, but I quite like it. It's got a good <laughs> soundtrack and stuff. Yeah, I remember the um, soundtrack being good. And I really yeah. like Christian Slater. And I, I've yeah. always enjoyed him. I think that's as a fine. performer. <laughs> but, um, but he's not very good in the next film I watch. So I watched uh, 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 cause it's because it was a bank holiday just gone. Uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves is on, which I love that film. Like Alan Rickman is amazing in that film. He's and, not good uh, in that film. No. Oh, he's so he's funny not. in it though. Like it's, it's, I'm not saying it's... no, no. Christian Slater. Oh, Christian Slater is terrible. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like everyone rags on Kevin Costner. I mean, he's just Kevin Costner in it. He was fine. I think he yeah, got a Kevin Razzie Costner. or he was nominated. Oh, for fuck a Razzie the Razzies. List, but like. <laughs> Razzie's never get anything right. But I was saying to you, like all films, especially like those big budget films around the like the late to early nineties, I swear have the same script doctor because they all (laughs) kind of have this wash of the same kind of humour. It's like how all the Marvel films have kind of that humour has kind of gone on to other films now, like Free Guy and all this kind of stuff. Like it's kind of spread out. I think a lot of films. um... Have you watched What If? Any of the What Ifs, the Marvel things? No, any good? No, no, they're awful. It just, I've um, seen people raving about, especially some of the, like the Chaz Bozeman one, um, where he's like Star Lord and stuff. <laughs> I disagree. I've like, seen people are just being kind, like because it's Maybe. his last. But what I was going to say, the first one is um, uh, Carter. What's her name? Captain Carter gets Peggy Carter. The, Peggy, thank you. Gets the. I was going to say gets the venom, <laughs> gets the super soldier thingy. Yeah, the serum, yeah. Um, so it's basically like a remake of Captain America First Avenger, but with right. like Peggy Carter as the as the hero. Um, not only is... You, you should watch it because the voice acting, some of the worst voice acting I've ever heard Isn't in any series. Isn't it the stars, though? Like, yeah, they can't voice act. The guy, like, Sebastian Stan is awful. Yeah, but <laughs> like, he's and, awful you know, in those films. I'm sorry, but, but that guy... I think guy... Chadwick Boseman is... Not good either. I think like whoever's doing the directing for the voice acting hasn't ever directed people to do voice acting before. It's really right. stilted. It's really badly delivered. It's really, it's really just, eh. Like it looks like really charisma. high frame rate CG animation, which was yeah, a the, turn off for me. It, the animation is a turn off for me as well. But like uh, the the remake of this Captain America, like it's it's written like a modern Marvel film, so it's full of all. This is what made me think of you, what you were saying. It's full of all that quippy writing that the new Marvel films are. But to watch all that kind of quippy bullshit writing transplanted on a film from like before Marvel started doing that is really jarring. Like the Captain America: First Avenger isn't that type of film. Yeah, it's you know? not. Like it's it's all, a Joe it? Johnson film. It's it's it not. It feels got more all like the Rocketeer or something, doesn't exactly, it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
And to have all this bullshit quippiness constant, and it like literally, it's constant. And it's fucking this th- thirty-minute cartoon or whatever. It's twenty-minute cartoon. It's fucking endless, and some of it falls so flat that it really ruins the whole thing. I think instead of them actually just like trying to actually play to the qualities of the film that they were like pastiching or honouring or something. Right. Blah blah blah. <laughs> is this all like in continuity with the films then? Is that all I with the multiverse thing? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yes. Yeah, it probably is. I think something's probably gonna come from it. Probably. Um and then the only other thing I watched, uh there was a new episode have you ever seen the Star Wars galleries on Disney Plus? No. So basically I think they do them for the Marvel films as well, but they're basically like making ofs and it's Okay. Uh, so for the first series of Mandalorian, they did like eight episodes, and they all like they're about an hour long each, and they all focus on like a sec a certain aspect. So like the effects, the character, the costumes, or the character designs, yeah. the stuff. So it's all stuff that I kind of really geek out in on. But like for s- series two, they only did like an hour long making of, but they didn't mention anything about Luke in it or anything like that because they're obviously trying to hide that. Mm. because it came out before the last episode but a few weeks like last week or whatever uh, a new episode came out and it was all about how they did the luke skywalker sequence oh cool okay like and how they kind of like hid it and they had like a bare bones crew and like they kind of uh do you know that like one jedi who looks like a fly and he's kind of got like <laughs> he looks like got tea strainers Is yeah it he's got, like, yeah it looks like he's got like tea strainers on it and stuff like, apparently yeah, in the yeah, script yeah, yeah. Plo it Plo said Plo, it was that. him that kind of takes ah. Grogu and he, he survived the um, you know the order whatever it's called I that would have been fun uh, but cool. it was all a ruse and like whenever they're on set they had to refer to the Jedi as that Clo Kloon and um, they did all artwork and they even did a CGI face so if anybody came into the office <laughs> <laughs> they'd see that face on the screen and not Mark Hamill's it's really God, weird it seems like a lot doesn't it yeah and I mean like I didn't think the effect in the end was amazing was that good no no and like they it's actually the have Mark Hamill they have Mark Hamill on set and you know he stands like a 70 year old man looks yeah. like a 70 yeah. year old yeah, 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 it's yeah. kind of like yeah. you know the Irishman <laughs> and it's like I don't think you need yeah, him for really. reference to be honest uh, I think I think he could have used a body double when he's doing the kicking. Well, they scene. they did have a body double, <laughs> and and they literally just yeah. But in the Irishman, that kicking scene's so funny. I know, but they tracked on like they they fed in like so much information of like young uh, Mark Hamill that they kind of like the algorithm. I don't know, like the AI kind of created like the the face <laughs> right. of Luke Skywalker, and then they they put in all sound recordings and all the because like I think. Uh, Mark Hamill did read a lot of the Star Wars audio books as well, so they kind of fed all that into the computer. It's almost like weird science, isn't it? And then yeah, it, it spat like out the audio basically, and that's why it sounds a bit stilted and a bit. Oh, so he didn't voice it? No, it's all like a computer. I mean, it is Mark Hamill, but via yeah, but a computer. He might as well be dead, is what you're telling me. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> like, I don't know why they even bothered having it on set. Maybe just yeah. Maybe just you can know, tell, to, get him to like, sign the release forms. <laughs> but you can tell he was like he doesn't say it or anything like that. But you can tell he was not happy with what happened with Last uh, Last Jedi, which is a shame because he was great yeah. in that film and I thought it was really fit for the character. It was really good. <laughs> but he he seems. I just got the impression he was not happy with it, and he was. This is the send off he, he he preferred for Luke and stuff. Fine. But um, but it's just so funny watching them shoot this like show because it's they shoot it on a thing called the volume, which is basically a, a giant soundstage. It's like a big yeah. video screen that goes all the way around. So they're actually filming with CGI environments in real time, so they don't have to do much post. I mean, they still do a bit of post, but mm. it's a bit less post. But it's just so funny when you're watching back at how they made the first Star Wars and they're putting Vaseline on the screen to hide the wheels on the <laughs> fucking. You know, Luke's brown hover car or whatever. It's just like, in 40 years, this is where we are now, where we, you know, it's it's pretty nuts, though, how they make I think, films. I think the volume now. is such an amazing, like, um, uh, like, step forward in technology, but it does give so much more power to the CGI artists and production staff oh, yeah, before it's... anything's shot. And it feels a little bit, like, it feels a little bit manicky. You know, mannequins oh, playing on a set I mean, it's, it's built like or something like. It's, 
I mean, it's pretty good in that it's quite, it's almost real time because I think it uses like the new and real engine, which is like yeah, it almost it is, renders yeah. things like in, you know, it doesn't need to render like, you know, like, but like even when I do a film now, you have to, you do a 20 second shot, you know, that's the whole day of you can't do anything because you're just rendering out that shot. <laughs> but like, you know, this is like <laughs> yeah, it all sure. in real time. <laughs> so, you know, they, they can probably do a lot more, but I, I agree with you, you know, you can never get better than a, a real set with real smoke and you know a real sky <laughs> you know you, you're never going to get better than that and um but you it know these, like these when, shows when are made on talk a, about you know these no, these shows they're trying to make them on on a low budget aren't they but make it still look as yeah. good as a star wars film because you know you can't star wars has yeah. got such it's got so much like on it that you know you can't do anything less than the films. So it's, it's got to match it at least, hasn't it? And I think yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I I think the Mandalorian did look good, but yeah, okay. Go. But um, you know, thankfully they you know they kept puppets and stuff like that, and so they did still have the tangible elements that the old Star Wars films had. And I'll gladly take this over, like the Attack of the Clones and all that stuff. But again, you probably need <laughs> to get through that stage to get to this. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah, the yeah. New, It's just about a... the new Batman film uses it a lot because because of COVID and stuff. They weren't able to film a lot of crowd scenes and things like that. So I think they use the volume to do a lot uh, of crowd cool. scenes and things like that. So that that'd be interesting. I'm not like I'm not like phobic or like luddite of new technology coming in or oh, anything no, no, like no. that. It's just kind of like it's 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 more like I'm interested in how it affects how m- movies are made more and affects like the how the way kind of stories are told or or how stuff on set works or how like people get different input and things i think it's really interesting to going forward about the role of the director or role of the writer or role of the actor yeah. inside the kind of inside the making the film kind of and how much control or freedom you have to kind of you know be pushed up against that creative kind of door you know <laughs> I think it's weird. But I do recommend them. They're quite good. And like, um, because they've got, I think Bryce Dallas Howard directed quite a few episodes and stuff. And, um, uh, you know, it's quite interesting seeing her direct, you know, considering who her father is and he did a Star Wars mm. film and stuff like that. And like the things that she did for Star Wars have, um, the fans reacted to a lot better than what her dad did. <laughs> Maybe we should get to do more stuff. Hope so, because she seems like you know she's she knows her stuff. I mean, you know, yeah. she's worked on all kinds of films, you know, with the Jurassic Park films, big budget yeah, films, yeah. and then low budget films as well, and stuff like that. And you know, she's been around film all her life, hasn't she? So yeah, exactly. And she, she seems like really a really nice person as well. <laughs> cool. But, but yeah, if you if you watch these shows, it's it's kind of like. Um, did you ever watch? Um, Johnny Fav's old show, like it was like Dinner for Five or whatever, and it was just him um, and like no, but I four of the famous people, and they'd sit around at a dinner table and just talk about their prof- like the acting or directing yeah. And stuff. Yeah. So there's like an episode with like Roger Corman, um, uh, Marty, uh, and some of the directors and stuff, and it's just talking <laughs> about how they knew each other and like you know how they got started and stuff. But the way they did these Star Wars shows was the exact same. They're all sitting around a dinner table, all chatting and stuff cool <laughs> it sounds fun actually it sounds like something to kind of fall asleep to a little bit oh yeah totally. it's boring yeah, yeah, yeah. just it's you know that kind of that kind of vibe to it yeah totally anyway shall we get to today's main topic let's do it let's move on so today's film is the 1988 spanish film called uh I was gonna, I'm forcing because I was about to try it in Spanish, but I'm not going to. It is Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown by um, Thingy. <laughs> I'm doing that all again. Pedro Alma- <laughs> a- Almodovar. We can't say his name, so we'll just dub it with his <laughs> pronunciation. To be fair, right. though, on the Graham Norton thing, he did say, however you want to say it's fine. So Yeah, he said, I don't care. Just say it, whatever. <laughs> okay, let me try that again. Right, so today's film is the 1988 comedy Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown by Pedro Almodovar. It's a romance, but it's not about love. 
It's a comedy, but not everyone's laughing. It's a place where the one thing you can expect is the unexpected. Women on the verge of a nervous breakdown. A story about women who love men. Todos estos años te he esperado. Dime que te hubieras muerto si no vuelvo. Estaría muerta si no hubieras vuelto. Women who love to get even. And men who try to get away. Iván, ¿quién esperabas que llamara? Iván, me ha llamado otra vez Iván. No. Ay, olvídalo ya, chica. ¿Quiere decirme quién es ese Iván? Eres un débil, Iván. Iván. ¿Dónde está Iván? ¡Iván! From internationally acclaimed filmmaker Pedro Almodovar comes a deliriously deranged comedy that follows no rules, spares no victims, takes no prisoners. Pero no me negará que aquí ha ocurrido algo raro. Women on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Uh, so yeah, this is um, a kind of a black comedy where you have this main character Pepper, and she um, her life's falling apart, and she goes to kind of, I guess, goes to kind of kill herself. Though it's a bit unclear, and um, around her, this kind of farce about the interrelationships between her boyfriend and her friends, and the happenings around that kind of overtake her life. I think that's the that's I don't know the plot of this film is yeah, a bit kind of hard like, to summarize. Yeah, I'd say that's about right. Yeah, about right. It's uh, I mean, we got plenty to talk about before we get to the plot of this film. Oh my god, like like there's so much context to absorb <laughs> in like, this film. <laughs> like, how much do you know, like Almodova? I, think I, I did the right pronunciation. Pretty it, much no. Well, I wouldn't say two of his most recent films, but the two I really know, Evolver and uh, the skin i live in those are the only two that i really kind of i don't know volver actually did. at all no it's a good film it's a good is film. it yeah, yeah and i know the cover i can i can picture it like it's red uh, <laughs> yeah red with penelope cruz cruz yep. cruz on it like on the cover yeah i mean he definitely should... likes to work with like the same yeah people, he's like he? a lot of the directors we've met we've done before who basically gets a crew and then keeps recycling them for all his films like and I Although think Volver, first... I think, was the first time he worked with uh, Carmen Mora again after... Like, they had a falling out, I think. Um, oh, did they? I think, I think it was Carmen Mora he had a falling out with. Yeah, so Carmen Mora plays the lead in this. She plays yeah. Peeper. Pepper? Peeper? Pepper? In this. I'm gonna, it's going to be a terrible episode for me pronouncing stuff. Like, at least, like, at least French and German, I did that school. Spanish, I have no... <laughs> no like experience of whatsoever yeah like in the slightest and i remember like i was uh because i got introduced by to pedro amadova when i used to live with a spanish girl and um she she knew i was into film so she was like we should watch this basically and she told me all about how great pedro is and all the stuff he's done and like how important it was to her growing up like in these films and things and um she constantly would try and get me to say stuff in spanish and the only thing i ever got from her is she decided that in Spain I have a speech impediment like I okay. have, you like, like like she said if you were in a Spanish school they would put you in another class <laughs> like, oh gosh <laughs> and, her, and it's something to do with I can't roll my R's and I can't I can't like do like the, the that like you know the way they, they lisp really naturally um, mm-hmm. I find that really difficult to do in like like gracias gracias and stuff like that. I find that really weird and difficult. And she was just like, no, no, when you speak Spanish, you have a speech impediment. <laughs> like, like, stop it. <laughs> so that's my that's my introduction to Spanish. And that was my introduction to Pedro Dolma, who is amazing, frankly. What he, film was like, it that she showed you? Or, like, first, was it? <laughs> it was The Skin I Live In. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> which isn't, which isn't the best a great film, though. It is a great film. I love that film. And she constantly was telling me to watch a film called The Spider, which is definitely not a film that he's done, so I don't know what she was on about. <laughs> but maybe uh, so one day I'll figure out what didn't, this film was. Like, Didn't um, Cronenberg do one called Spider? 
He did. Yeah, he did do Spider. I don't think she was yeah. on about that. She was definitely on about no. a Spanish language film. <laughs> but he's... um, He's... Like, you can't talk about Pedro. You can't talk about Amadova's career without understanding kind of Spain a little bit. It's It's actually really quite crucial to why he was so popular and why he was so important and why like he's an absolute Spanish icon like no matter what you think of his films or if you like them or don't or how like a lot of his films are quite controversial like and still controversial themes to them and and in like ways of presenting stuff but the entire thing came out of the fact of like he was emerging from like post Franco Spain that post dictatorship of Spain and um only like so franco i you know we won't talk about the franco administration much but like franco stopped in like 75 that's when he died and that's when the mo- that's when like the kind of the country tried to move on and become like this democracy so when this film came out in 88 it, like spain had been a democracy for 10 years like it was still like a new thing it was a new country it was a new so emerging to try and find the identity and anything the franco regime to, to to play into this the franco regime was really crushing on kind of like expression of art like well, the franco what regime I read was, really I read that like a lot of people wore very dowdy clothes and stuff and mm-hmm. then like mm-hmm. carmen mora i think she was in a, like a punk rock band or something yeah so she kind of wore very loud kind of clothing and stuff and like this was one of the first kind of films that was very like so even though now it probably doesn't look very controversial it probably was at the time just in terms of its presentation like it wasn't it was just that expression of color and expression of differences you know like like so if you watch the film it starts off with like a pop art kind of yeah uh, yeah loads of collage you'd like kind of like a what do you call it credit sequence and stuff yeah but then the colors just like pop at you and the like she wears bright red clothing and stuff like that and yeah apparently that was stuff that she bought into the the character of the film and stuff and then yeah after this film apparently a lot of people started to kind of start to dress like that and stuff and kind of yeah it was it was like it's even like the interior decorating you know like there's there's pink toilets and red tiles on the walls and like and like um, pink lampshades like it's it's bringing color all into this world that like franco had really stomped out because like the kind of spanish catholic regime had basically taken over everything and the other side of it like you know pedro amadova growing up he wanted to go to film school and he, and franco closed down his film school basically <laughs> before he got there so instead he just bought like a super 8 camera and he started just like making super 8 films wherever he could and showing them wherever he could and you know that led to him being like you know arrested for it i think antonio banderas who you know, is intrinsically linked to to Amadova, and um, he was the same thing. He used to perform in these theatre groups, and because it was illegal to perform, he used to perform in like wherever they could. You know, on, on street corners, in inside cafes, in underground like like theatres, even though they weren't doing anything particularly like transgressive but any kind of performance of art was transgressive. You know, like at that time, and he he literally had shows shut down because he was in prison because he got arrested the night before. You know, of trying to do stuff and and thinking about coming out of that era and then something like 80 i don't know 82 or something 84 he does a film with pedro andovar called law of desire where he plays a gay man to do that in like just coming out of this like this era of franco is absolutely like so transgressive and so like transformative to the spanish society to be them not just saying that like gay people exist but actually saying that gay people are accepted and part of our world and and should be something you love is was huge you know like it was massive and it just felt like that kind of crushing cultural weight that the franco years was what it led to was actually i think i think if britain came out the same thing we wouldn't do this we'd we'd be quite downtrodden trying to be quite upset about us coming out of like a like a kind of fascist regime but the but the way Spain dealt was of it was like this burst of creativity, burst of like new music, new films, looking at color in their language, like the even the way characters spoke in Pedro Almodovar films came into like the, the language of like Madrid and stuff. Like you know, it it pushed up their society and wanted them to find differences. You know, wanted to find more, find, wanting to find color and and a big part of that kind of push of like 
the society was the women in the society like women in um pedro and Dobar's films are always older women that are quicker to adapt to new changes than men like and and that was the way he saw his world changing around him that these older women were much quicker to adapt to differences and to and to like move with the modern world than he saw the men doing so well, yeah, i've just gone in a rant and, like, <laughs> how old how old do you reckon she's supposed to be like late 30s or something like that yeah, in uh, Peeper, Pepper in this. Can you say yeah. Peeper? Like, yeah, I reckon. I reckon mid mid to late 30s. Yeah, because all of be. her friends are like a lot younger. So her best friend, yeah. model, she's like in her early 20s, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, Antonio Banderas is quite young in this film, isn't he? He must have been like mid 20s, maybe. He must have been in his mid 20s. Yeah, he looks, he looks like a child. He looks so yeah. young in this film. Because <laughs> you know, I'm so used to seeing him much older. But um, I mean, he's 61 now, so he was like. Yeah, he was 30. He was just about 30 in this film, 28. Like, but yeah, like he's always picked interesting roles, hasn't he? Like even like Phil yeah. like he was never shy of like before like, you know, Philadelphia, wasn't he um Tom yeah, Hanks's boyfriend in that film. Tom Hanks's boyfriend in that and he yeah. didn't speak English at the time. He did that in in and uh, they did the whole performance phonetically, you know, wow. with the phonetic script and stuff. But that was a big thing, like, oh, my God, how can someone come over here and play gay? You know, that would ruin you in Hollywood. And he's he was doing it in, the, you know, in Spain for years before. And because like, Pedro's a gay man wow. and they had they had no... And, like, he just loved to explore all that stuff. It's well, really funny at, how Hollywood was so, like, squeamish about it. And yeah, I mean, so it, it, it didn't hurt his career. He became an action star after that. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it didn't hurt him at all, like, in the slightest. Like, it's crazy. And, like, you know, it's just... I find like I, I just think that's the really important key thing to understand about ever watching an Amadova film, at least especially this period. Whereas like he other Spanish filmmakers were still making, you know, this is a quote from Amadova, making like really dire civil war films. He said like every filmmaker was obsessed with making civil war films and they they just showed like the kind of pain and the drudgery of like the reality and he had no interest in doing that he had no, like, he, he wanted to make something arty and conceptual and and big and loud and, like he wanted people to laugh he didn't want like he, he didn't he, 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 people would say he was too populist but he just wanted to make something that was like you know brought joy and brought like color and brought like something else to it and i i just think that's really i think that's a reason why he's become he's always been so important for spanish film and just so loud in Spanish film is because he did that really, and um, you read essays about him, and people talk about him in the people talk about him the same way you talk about like Shakespeare in England, like in the fact wow. that he <laughs> changed like the language and the way people dressed and spoke. You know, he had a big impact of it. And there's an argument, you know, was society driving him or him driving society? You know, I think it's probably both. Oh, but yeah, you but, can both work mutually together, can't you? Yeah. So- but I think it's and like I think without that context, you can't quite understand watching, especially the eighties films of Amadova, exactly what exactly he's doing. Um, more than just it's a funny film kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, if yeah. you're going to bring some context to it. <laughs> and anyway, I've I've got into a role. Then I apologise. That's all right. No. <laughs> nice. I just find it so interesting. I, I like I know very little about Spanish film at all. Um, really apart from no like, what almost what Amado was brought to it i know more about spanish language film you know mexican yeah, films like, i think yeah like, like rodriguez and, and stuff like del toro that. yeah but actual spanish films I, it's something i'm i i would love to know more about mm. you know other spanish filmmakers and stuff i really don't i really only know spanish film through the lens of Amadova and the cast of actors he's used you know that that end up going into hollywood and stuff but yeah, what did you like? What did you think of the film? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, definitely. Like, um, I didn't really know what to expect. I have to say, um, mm-hmm. I didn't know I was going to watch a kind of caper or a kind of farce. What, what, do you, what would you say it is? It's oh, a no, bit I like... was going to say it's definitely farcical, isn't it? It's almost like yeah, it's it, it's very soap opera. Yes, in yeah. A way. But you no, know, what's what they call them? like telenovelas or some I don't know telenovelas. Kind of like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but like. I I I had a good time watching this film, um, and like the some of the shots were like, like you could tell it didn't have a massive budget. You know, there's mm. nothing, there's no grandiose camera movements and stuff like that. But <laughs> sure, but, but it's really inventive. Like this one shot when because like one of the things she does a lot in the film is she's constantly she's almost having a relationship with her ex partner through 
for uh, the answer machine the answer machines which i think yeah. is like what the film's kind of loosely based on is like a... yeah the it's the french play is it the human voice yeah which weirdly enough he made last year during the pandemic um, with oh, okay. tilda swinton which I haven't, I should watch. Uh, but okay. he did like a performance with Tilda Swinton of, of the human voice, which is a pretty weird thing to do if he's kind of adapted it, you know, this early in his career. Because I kind of figured you wouldn't see Ivan, who was her ex partner, properly. No, I yeah. See, I thought yeah. you'd only see, like, hear his voice on the um, Ants Machine or because she she's an actress and she also does voiceover uh, work in she films. She's dubbing, and- yeah. So there's a scene in it where she has... It's a great scene, actually, where she's kind of reacting to his audio, I believe, because he's an actor yes. as well. And yeah. she's reacting to his audio and then saying her... Like, it's crazy how they do the voiceover. They just stick a fucking microphone in the middle of a, like a <laughs> cinema screening room and thinking, hang on a minute. Is this really <laughs> how they do it? Yes. And there's like all, I... like all loads of them all grouped around each other. But... um. But I was going to say, like, there's a wicked shot, though, where it's like the p- point of view of the cassette tape. It's like they kind of... Yes, yeah. Like, there's, That's like, no depth shot. of field. It's, like, completely... Oh, like, everything's in focus. Like, there's loads of shots of, like, objects in front of the camera. Yeah. But they're always, like, in focus with the, like, the character in the foreground, as in the background, sorry. But, like, as I said, there's one like, of a cassette tape as it's playing, and you see her face, like, through the cassette tape. But the yeah. cassette tape is still in focus. <laughs> and then, like, there's a, this crazy model shot at the beginning as well, which... That establishing shot, I can't stop thinking of it. I can't stop thinking <laughs> like, that he it's just put... Insane. It's so, like, it's so purposeful that this looks like a model. Do you know what I mean? There's no way that it... Oh, it, yeah, yeah. It's no way it was meant to be read any other way. It was meant, it's meant to look like a model. And it's just presented as this is the establishing shot of this, this you know, this film. I can't stop thinking of it. The plastic trees and the little like figurines and stuff. Well, it's like got to be purposeful wonderful. because like, there's plenty of shots. All actually, do you see a wide of her? I don't know if you no, ever see don't. a wide of her apartment because she lives no. like in a um in the penthouse. penthouse right. she? Yeah, and she's cut, she's almost got like a farm on her patio. <laughs> yeah, she does that. Loads and of chickens and ducks. You yeah. can tell it's a set or whatever because the sky is always perfect, isn't yes. it? It's like a it's like you know it's a massive huge printout of a the skyline or whatever. It's really um, funny, actually, like, because he talks about the artifice of this. Like, he, it was the point of it, basically. Like, um, but this set, the, like, Pepper's uh, penthouse set was incredibly expensive, like, and they basically couldn't justify the expense of it, really. So every time, every day he was shooting on it, he was, and especially his brother, which is the producer of his films, uh, they were constantly thinking about how can they make the most out of this set um, that, that they spent so much money on. And what they came up with was actually they would shoot the next movie on it. Um, oh, okay. So, so Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down, which is the next film he does, they were thinking about that time all the time when they were on set shooting this. And while on set shooting this, they they wrote the outline of the film and what they were, what the film was going to be. And his whole idea was is they would use the same actors from this film and the same set, but um, they would take it beyond the set. So the whole idea with like Time Me Up, Time Me Down is the original one is a bit different, but basically a, a psychopath escapes from a maximum security jail and takes refuge in a film studio. Um, so he, oh, so he liked the set Id- is a set within the set. Yeah, like a, so he like liked the film. idea of showing basically like Pepper's apartment from the back, like, you know, pad- like, yeah, pulling out, yeah, okay, and, pu- and pulling that all away really. And um, I got a quote. It's a little long, but like he basically says that like. Um, uh, he's obsessed with when sets represent themselves, when the false represents falsity, like when a studio represents a studio in which walls are held up with braces. There are these theoretical elements that every movie is born with that I like to reveal, the, like the phys- physiology of that film language, the authenticity of artifice. There's nothing more offensive than naked artifice. Like So that stuff you're getting from this film, like the kind of the sets, the sky is all like the same, the the plastic plants on like the kind of um on the veranda and stuff like that. That's all stuff he kind of wanted to put in it. He wanted the lighting to be there. He wanted to see window frames. He wanted you to see the maze of woodwork because he was obsessed with this being fake and and basically but obsessed it- with the fact that like fake cities are built in these four walls of studios. Um, that they live there. He was obsessed. But it's kind of almost just like not hiding the- that. The mag like because like the intro sequence is like well, it looks like a magazine like yeah yeah like, like you know like almost like an IKEA catalog of this is a living room but like 
an 80s yeah. version of that. And they, you know how fake they look. You know, you know mm-hmm. it's a plastic tree, a plastic plant on the table. Yeah. But it's all <laughs> yeah. that in the film. And it, 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 it just looks great. It's got this kind of fake artifice look to it, but it's... But the film's really alive, though. It's it's weird. yeah, it brings it all alive. I think like my my theory, and I was I'm doing so much reading around to try and find this is true, and it must be true, but I just haven't found like a quote that that kind of um, you know solidifies it to me. But the um, the the English title of this is not a really good translation of the Spanish title. Like uh, the Spanish title is Attacker like- de Nervos. Yeah, attack of the nerves or something i don't know yeah which is more like in english what we would call like hysteria like yeah. this idea of like women's troubles or a way or the way that women dramatically overreact to stuff like a ner- <laughs> like like a nervous breakdown is a serious thing you know like or like a panic attack's a serious thing but like an attack of the nerves um is is much more like and the best way i've been able to find because i'm you know, I don't understand the culture, but the best way I've been able to understand it is in like telenovelas, in these kind of Spanish language, like like soap operas, when you have like the lead women character react, they like throw themselves on the floor, their hands yeah, in the like, air, <gasps> kind of thing. Like yeah, 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 properly like oh my like oh me I don't know, like and properly like like play into it. It's that that's the kind of cultural thing like that's the attack of the nerves that kind of overplaying of like these emotions but then the next thing you get up and you know you just go off about your day it's kind of like it has no like permanent effect on you um and that's really what the title's referring to so i think if that's the title and the whole film is shot like these kind of artifice sets i think it's meant to feel like this telenovela i think it's meant to to make you sit there thinking you're watching these spanish soap operas these these things and and play into that i, I i'm sure that's must be all part of it well i mean I like, like it just feels right you know well you have like the ex-lover who has like lived in a mental institute or whatever yes. for years <laughs> and then suddenly wants to get her revenge at the end you know yeah. she's you find out the main character's pregnant you know one yeah, character yeah, yeah, yeah. is drugged so much that she believes she's had sex in her in her mind or she's no longer a virgin because she's had I, the best i think that's a rape joke Ollie. <laughs> oh is it a rape joke what i, I don't it's I a rape joke that. I was re- like okay. i was the same thing i looked that up and i think it's the the, the joke is that the painter decorator had sex with her while she was asleep i think i think that's what that refers to almodovar is not above doing rape jokes in his films like this is every so all my on, research hey, everything in the reading. film that's meant to have happened yes apparently apparently on, when, I have, though, like, because when, when the guy who comes to fix the telephone apparently yeah because he's a, point, he's no, there no, at the end he, he can't when he be falls because a- he's always behind the sofa and he falls asleep <laughs> yeah but he's when they're when they're going out of the apartment to chuck out of all Ivan's stuff. It's her and him in the apartment alone ah, for ages. Yeah, okay, okay, um, I didn't clock on to that. I apologize. No, I didn't. I I looked it up because I was like, I don't really understand that line. Is it she's saying that her like dream was so sexual that she feels like she lost her well, I virginity? Well, I thought it referred to a bit earlier that on. What it was? She's she's fluttering her eyes all over the place. Yeah, yeah, I she's hit, yeah, she's having like a sexy dream, isn't she? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's I don't made know. it even bleak. I mean, it is a black comedy <laughs> at the end of the day. So, I mean, well, I think, like, I was, because yeah. I, I was, um, I was reading an interview with uh, Wes Anderson. Uh, he was saying how he takes a lot of his stuff from um, Amadovar films. Like, and you can definitely you, see you can, that. You can definitely see that, yeah. And he points out, he basically talks about rape jokes. He says that if anyone's going to do Amadovar, like, rape jokes, it's Amadovar. Like, some reason he gets away with it. And maybe he doesn't in today's society, but in the eighties, you know, it's a different well, thing. I mean, um, but just you saying that about Wes Anderson, you know, a lot of his film, like you know, the uh, the hotel, whatever, you know, all of those wide shots are always like a, those artifice, a model, aren't they? And stuff. And stuff like yeah, that, absolutely. Know. Yeah, it really makes sense. Actually, I never, I always kind of wondered where he got that kind of look from, and it does make sense that he got it from this. Yeah. Stuff. Uh, but he basically said there was a rape joke in um, um, uh, Steve Zissou. Um, which was in the script and he wrote it purposefully as like a Almodovar rape joke and it made it all the way through and they didn't film it on set they oh, basically okay. cut it at the last second and it's it was basically like it's when they're captured by pirates and Steve Zissou asks one of the interns if they're doing okay and they really deadpan go I'm doing a fi- I'm doing fine but I was raped or I'm doing really oh, bad okay. but I'm, I was raped or something and they cut out the last part of it 
and well, they were just which like which character would that would be because if I remember there's only one female there's only one intern. female intern yeah is she then what is naked like, when they pan to her and she's like topless I think so <laughs> yeah. yeah I think so and it, I just like Wes Anderson going I think Almodovar would have gotten away with this but I can't yeah <laughs> like, and I'm like that's there's a good call there's certain things <laughs> European filmmakers can do I don't <laughs> yeah. think especially, especially a, in yeah Especially in the eighties as well, yeah, it's a different yeah. thing. <laughs> no, I've, I I'm pretty dense sometimes to subtext or whatever. So yeah, that one I <laughs> flew over my head. Well, I was I, I was to say I looked at it might not be I might be talking absolute bollocks, like, but I I did I I noticed that line. I was like, that's weird. What does that mean? <laughs> Basically, like, well, what, if, what if is you this? can read that into it, then it's definitely something that has merit. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. But that's nice. I love that. You know. I'll just say I love that last scene um, because it's like after everything that's happened during the film and all the kind of drama and all the kind of relationships ending you know and people taking control of themselves and stuff like that like she's the last character in the film that has has had had no kind of like agency whatsoever because she was asleep the whole film yeah but then to have that like quiet little bit at the end of those two characters kind of establishing each other and building well, the each whole other credit up sequence just... is just them sitting on the yeah um, on looking the at deck chair looking at the fake madrid back back them i just thought that was really great <laughs> like just really good like tranquil tranquil kind of finish to this this like madcap film it made me it was one of those like like the end like I watched Time Yet Time Me Down after this yesterday because I was really interested in it. And um, the last scene of that film is literally plus one star for me. <laughs> like, you know what yeah. I mean? It was like so powerful. I was wow. like, right, yep, I fucking loved it. And it was the same thing with that, just that moment of tranquility on top of Pepper's like apartment. I was like, yeah, that's that's exactly how this finished. And it made me feel like really good about everything else. You know, it made me kind of it, like pumped up the rest of the film for me that that's the way that he chose to finish it. Rather so, than like a freeze frame in the airport or something, you know. So in this film, Antonio Banderas plays Carlos, who is uh, Ivan's son. Yeah. And Pepper didn't know anything about him, which shows that he she obviously didn't know much about his life, really. Or he wasn't, you know. He, he wasn't didn't. open, at least, yeah. yeah. Um, but like he kind of enters the film. Well, you see him earlier in the film when she's kind of like spying on the house and stuff like that. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. But when he enters her life, he's like literally he's he's with his girlfriend or fiance looking for an fiance, apartment to yeah. rent, and it just so happens to be Pepper's uh, apartment. But like how ingrated he becomes and his fiance <laughs> into her into her life life is, <laughs> and how like willing he is to kind of it's so be part of it, and how then touchy feely she is with him. Because obviously yeah, she, yeah. Knew, she kind of knew who he was anyway. He knew who she was, yeah. Because yeah. they knew that her. Obviously, yeah. they knew Ivan had gone off with someone. But yeah, but she, she's had, so touchy feely with him. I kind of loved how, like, yeah. instantly they were like, you know, stepmom and so. Well, I didn't know where like, it was going to go. I didn't know if yeah, it was yeah. going to go the other way. But then, obviously, <laughs> sure. then you have her best friend. Is it Lucia? Mm. No. No, can Candela, Candela, say so. who's the yeah. model, and she yeah. bursts into the film like she's all distraught. with her own insane plot. And like. She's <laughs> desperate to tell Pepper about it, but Pepper's like, "I'm too busy with my own problems to like." Yeah, yours. don't and you then... don't you just love that Pepper is not a good character, like good person in her oh, own yeah, way. Oh yeah, she's like, yeah, she's you know self involved, like she's self involved and everything, and I just love it. I love her for it. It makes us better. But you know? I like, think like, like, she she. She does have a a decent side to her, though. She does eventually yeah, like, yeah. listen to her friend and try to help her friend and stuff. But like, so you find it's out just to have that... to have like two female characters, especially in a film in the eighties, where it's like they're kind like one of them's basically like, I don't give a shit about your problems. I got my own crap yeah. to deal with. <laughs> like, okay, you're gonna kill yourself. Fuck off. Like, to have that, I think, is so cool and so different. I think like, and I can't see that coming out of much other stuff in this time period, really. And maybe I don't. Know, maybe I'm overestimating that, but it just felt really different to me. If like, as as like writing female characters goes, yeah. But so what's her problem? She she's slept with and had a relationship with a shiite. I can't say <laughs> she, shiite terrorist. She, yeah, shiite terrorist. And then they all kind she of fell in love out. with one. 
Yeah. yeah, and then they all kind of like take over a house or whatever, and then now they're pl- planning to blow up a plane. Yeah, they keep inviting more Shiite terrorists over yeah. to live with them, <laughs> and then she finds <laughs> out they're planning to blow up a plane, and realizing she's like been part of this terrorist plot, she escapes to kind of tell her best friend about it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and then almost tries to commit suicide. Yeah, she throws herself off the balcony. But yeah. then, you know, she helped Pepper and Carlos and that help her up and stuff. Um, but so, do you think Pepper... Because Pepper later on says that she spiked the um, the drink, you know, the soup or whatever, with the... <laughs> because, uh, yeah. What was it, with methadone? No, what was it? Oh, it's like barbiturates or something, yeah. isn't it? It's like, um, she basically, she goes to the drugstore to get sleeping tablets. I love that scene. Um, but she says later on, it's for Ivan. But do you think it was really oh, for her? Then? Yeah, I mean, maybe she said it was for Ivan just to kind of make it... Like I she think it's wasn't really, suicide. really unclear why yeah. she does it. I think that doesn't... Like, I keep reading people. Everyone says that she tries to kill herself, but I don't particularly think it's in the script. Yeah. Uh, but the only thing it... I, the only thing I got from it is, like, just as she does that, it's when, like, she sets her bed on fire by accident. But <laughs> yeah. instead of, like... Instead of rushing to put the bed out, she kind of just watches the flames consume it and kind of like happily stands there with it, with it kind of consuming. Yeah, but we all know her. it's like when you look into fire, you get lost in it. <laughs> We've had many of a that... fire at my parents where we just stare at fire for about. You just spend the evening looking at the <laughs> fire and going, "Yep, fire." <laughs> like, but I think like that. And you, I mean, at obviously, 15, three o'clock in the morning, saying, "Yeah, I want sausages now." That's so you the time drag to have the barbecue sausages. out and set it up again. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> and what was I saying? Yeah, that the double imagery of obviously the bed on fire is like that kind of like end to her relationship kind of thing. Um, yeah, well, that's where they had sex, I assume, and stuff. So she's I like, assume, Fuck it. probably around the apartment. <laughs> yeah, but um, <laughs> In and around. But the um, but also like she has that of not wanting to put it out. It seems like just wanting to burn her life down. Which I assume that's a suicidal thing. I assume so. That I assume that imagery goes straight to her filling the gazpacho with hundreds of like barbiturates. If she planned to drink it all, it would be suicide, I guess. Like, um, I so I guess that's where it's coming from. But it's not explicitly clear in the kind of film what she's going to do with it because she doesn't actually have any herself. As soon as she, as soon as she does it, she sets her bed on fire, and then that's when everyone turns up, basically. Isn't it? <laughs> And starts like coming into her life, and I was thinking, I was just thinking, like when you were talking about the dubbing earlier. Sorry, like because, like the way that he frames it when they're doing their readings of having them superimposed over the characters on the screen, I thought was so cool. Like I don't know what film they're dubbing actually. It's it's um, Johnny Guitar, isn't it, with Joan Crawford and Johnny Joe Guitar Sterling with Joan Crawford? Yeah. So it's like a, um, isn't that a fifties film? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, and so they got, like, when Joan Crawford's on screen, you've got, like, um, Carmen Marora o- o- overimposed her on her doing all the lines. And I just thought that was so, like, I just thought, like, his shooting of dubbing was really, like, cinematically lovable. Like, you know, he. he it's almost the like the Band Aid video. <laughs> the more, <laughs> like, grouped around with the headphones on. But like he he shows like the beam of light from the projector, you know, like like going onto the screen. Oh, yeah. He shows all that kind of setup and stuff. Like it's something obviously it filled really loving to me that this is part of like Spanish filmmaking or something. You know, you can't get around the fact that we dub things. So he kind of showed it as a kind of a loving thing. I felt like, um, which I've never seen anything. You know, I just like seeing. I guess I like seeing cinema portrayed in that way on screen. Is what I get. I guess got to me. So- the one thing I was a little confused about was so obviously we know she's a, she does like audio dubbing, yeah. But so she's an actress as well. Is it a television commercial? She's famous for playing the mother of a, a serial killer or something, or is it? Is yeah. she in a soap? Or is she a character in a soap opera? I thought it was a soap opera, but I'm not sure because um, there is an advert with her like advertising. There is, some isn't sort there? Yeah, washing material or something. I don't. Know. Because all the people fabric. like that she interacts with day to day, like all the, I love the people in the um, pharmacy all popping around the f- corner with their face masks on. Um, yeah, they all well, know her as like a celebrity kind of thing. Well, it's not a big cast. There's only like probably like ten people in the film, but there's like three sure. or four like little bit parts that are amazing. You've yeah. got 
You've got the woman who works at the, the secretary, who's kind of a bit. I the secretary was so good that I couldn't believe she was like only in the beginning of it. I kept yeah, expecting yeah. her to come back because she was such a big character at that beginning of the film. Like I, I you know, I immense, immensely, uh, sorry, immediately fell in love with her. Thought she was hilarious. Wanted to see more of her kind of thing. Totally, like, yeah. Such a loud kind of bit character. It's so, it's so cool. But then you've also got the porter lady or whatever. She kind of mm. porter, but she kind of works yeah, yeah, at the desk of the apartment where she lives. Yeah, she kind looks of, after the lift. Yeah, yeah. She finds the woman's shoe and stuff. She's like a yeah. Jehovah's Witness, and she's quite amazing yeah. as well. But the best is the taxi driver. Oh god, the taxi driver is so good. <laughs> the conscientious <laughs> taxi so driver good. who, when he he's like all distraught that he hasn't got any like um, eye drops. <laughs> when she yes. needs some eye drops from having that um, gazpacho thrown in her face, <laughs> she he just so happens to have the eye drops. Yes, but this guy oh, and so he's, in, his, in his cab, he's got like cigarettes, like all different brands of cigarettes that you can buy. He's got all magazines with all celebrities. Yeah, that sign on says like stuff. "Thank you for smoking" or something, doesn't it? That's the amazing bit as well. In this, in the hospital when she's, you know, you'd later find out that she's going to have a baby. <laughs> the doctor's got a big cigarette in his hand. <laughs> The 80s. I love it, and he's like, you know, if you don't like the Mambo music, we got rock and roll, we got this, we got <laughs> punk, got we got punk, like, yeah. and, and she's like, no, I like Mambo, and he goes, yeah, it goes with the deco, doesn't it? Like, this is the best, like, the best his music hair, for this cab. His, his hair reminded me of Beavis though, from Beavis and Butthead. It's like <laughs> this big yellow poof of a. It know, reminds me of. A, it reminded me of Guy Fieri, if I'm honest. <laughs> It's like Guy Fieri's taxi. <laughs> he just doesn't have the soul patch or whatever the little no. the go to. I love that taxi driver. I loved that he kept on coming back into it. Like because he, he, he first just at the right moment, he just so happened to yeah, swing by. He just appears because <laughs> you first introduced with him that he like she's following um, the mom, the grandmother of of Antonio Banderas uh, to find out where they live or something like that, or, yeah. or where Ivan might be. Um, and she jumps into his cab and says, "Like follow that cab in front of him." And he's just like, "Oh, that ne- this never happens in real life." I thought this only happened in the movies, kind of thing. And he's really excited about it, like and really like, like dragged. Like she, she's like a character that she drags other people into her world, kind of thing. Like so, by interacting with the taxi driver, he's now part of the whatever madcap stuff that's going on in Pepper's world, like. And I, I just like the fact that because of that, whenever she needs to jump into a taxi, he's there to be like, right, what's next on this adventure kind of thing? Like, you know, like I'm part of this story too. It just, it really, really makes that like film work in that kind of like madcap screwball reality that it's kind of filmed in. You kind of have that little rear window kind of little homage as well when she's like, she's looking at the different rooms like the windows of the apartment block oh yeah trying to That's find true, out yeah. and you kind of just get glimpses of like several different people living in their apartments until she finds like uh, antonio banderos and um um but yeah um it's like just peppered with lots of nice just interesting little bits and just kind in- of little things yeah how does it keep building up so so what we got so so we've got she comes back to apartment she makes the capacho, she sets a bed on fire, then yeah. Candela arrives. Or does Antonio Banderas arrive first? No, I think... Antonio Can- ben- Oh, I don't know, I actually. I think it's Antonio... I'm not sure, actually. Maybe, Any- let's say, Candela arrives. And she starts talking about the fact that, like, um, you know, she's got her own problems and Pepper doesn't give a damn about her problems. And then Carlos arrives with uh, his fiance Marisa. Um yeah. We should Pepper's talk about bro- a little Pepper's bit. broken her phone though at this point. Oh yeah, yeah. She's just, she throws that Ivan... phone out of, out the window a hundred yeah. times. <laughs> but Ivan wants basically like he wants a bag of his clothing because oh, he's going that's away. The thing, yeah, okay, yeah. And so, so Ivan's left her. Yeah, but he's left an answering machine message saying that can you pack me a bag for me to yeah. go away with, which is a bit of a rude request, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think he makes out like he's going alone and it's like later yeah. on in the film she kind of pieces together that when you because when we found out about the Shiite terrorists and stuff Pepper goes to visit a uh, a, lawyer. a lawyer yeah who's who, who doesn't really says, like her like, very much yeah Carla says that she's a feminist lawyer so she will help you yeah. 
And when she gets there, the, the lawyer's really, really icy to her and really unhelpful. And like she gets a really weird kind of feeling from her, doesn't she? Like, like yeah. what's up with her? And she kind of slowly pieces it together that Ivan's dating her yeah. um, and they're going away together. That's it. That's but it, anyway, isn't it? Back to the back to the apartment. I was going to say about um, we should talk a little bit about uh, Rossi Rossi De Palma Rosie De Palma who plays uh, the fiance because I think like um, Mar- she, she plays Marisa because I think if there's one actress who she has such like unique look to her she's got like, such a distinctive face it's kind yeah. of, it's not she's not an attractive or anything but it's like a long. But like she, she's described nice. described in like Spanish press as like Picasso come to life, you know, like a Picasso come to I life. I can like, see that. I can see that. And she's got that long face, you know, really distinctive nose, like really like sharp eyebrows and deep set eyes, you know, like she almost looks like like I don't know, like how would you describe as hawkish? Maybe and I don't mean to be mean because she's really like she's gorgeous. But yeah, 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 I think yeah. if you ever go, if if. Any, if you ever ask anyone to draw like a woman in like an Amadova film, they would draw her kind of yeah. thing, because um, she just has such such an, an image to her, and uh, she doesn't do much in this because she's asleep the whole film. <laughs> but um, but she still has such an effect on the whole film that I think you would you'd be forgiven for not realizing she's asleep for the whole film. She has such such like a a weight to the whole film and, and just makes an impression like all the kind of posters have her on it as a kind of fourth lead you know like um well i think and- she was i think she wasn't sure about doing this film or she was question i can't remember if it's the main actress. this is her first film this is her first film it's uh, either her would- or i read an interview it's either carmen maria or her and they kind of were upset that they were like so i've come into work for the whole day and all you're doing is filming my legs you know, while I'm asleep <laughs> okay. or whatever. And I can't remember who it was now, but one of them kind of didn't kind of get it. Oh right. But then kind of got into the groove of it. So it could have been her. I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I was reading it well, very she, late last night. She basically gets adopted by um Pedro and Dover. He, she's in like loads of his films now. Like 'cause um she she was basically discovered in nineteen eighty six. She was a waitress in a cafe in, in um Madrid. And Pedro just came up to him and was just like, "You look amazing. I want to put you in my film, basically." <laughs> like, and I think she might have been a. She was probably like a a the model sport. or something yeah. at the time or something, you know. Like, uh, but this is her basically first named role. She was in, in she was in Law of Desire in 1987 for Pedro, but this is when she first had like a um. A yeah, named no, this role. is the actress. Sorry, yeah, this is the one who yeah. was upset because like she was asleep through the whole film. but i I don't think um, but i think she realized how important she was at the end when she kind of comes yeah she has she she got nominated for like a best supporting actress for this yeah yeah, yeah. (laughs) like which is amazing (laughs) like and then she's in time up time me down as well she plays a drug dealer in that and she has such a good look to her in that film like she has the converse on and these kind of high rise like baggy jeans and then the kind of like a plaid shirt that's like tied up above it like kind of frilly pad like shirt and I was looking at going honestly that's like fashion now like it, like like somehow it's come round to this kind of look to her um, and she's there yeah, she's just an icon I guess is what I'm saying <laughs> like and she spends this film asleep I'm just looking at stills of that film I need to see this film it's. I really loved it. It's incredibly it controversial. He, <laughs> like, he loves like, red, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. The in time and time down. The... Actually, there's a bit in that where there's a ton of He-Man action figures. Hey, along, I'm like, sorry. Uh, I know. Yeah, that was, I was pretty, thinking of you. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure though that Pepper and Marissa they're both wearing red, aren't they? Especially at the end, anyway. Yeah, I think she's wearing definitely. Red. Yeah, there's. It's all about red. It's Spanish red, you know, like oh, fiery yeah, it's also... passion. It's also worth noting that Carlos keeps hitting on Candela as well throughout yeah. the whole film. Yeah, so I was going <laughs> like, to say, so they get like when she Maria passes gets out. bored, doesn't she? Maria gets bored and she goes to and she finds some gazpacho in the fridge. Yeah, because you she just raid some, some someone random's fridge, don't you? That's what you do. Yeah, I probably would. <laughs> 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 and um, if I was bored and like they were just rabbiting on about bullshit, I might disappear as well and, ra- and raid some gazpacho. You know, I don't know. But yeah, that sends it to sleep, and um, 
<laughs> then um, Carlos then takes the opportunity just to hit on this new girl because <laughs> his fiance is asleep. It work, you know that's how it works. And um, it's basically after she tries to kill herself, isn't it? She tries to kill herself, and then Carlos gets all kind of like caught up with her, and she gets and he gets so up to the fact that she's had this affair with this Shiite terrorist, and it's so exciting and different and weird. And he then calls the police, doesn't he, to oh, leave like he an anonymous the phone. tip. For some reason, yeah. he's given the oh, task yeah. to fix the phone. <laughs> Yeah, he's a man. He can fix the phone, and uh, <laughs> and and uh, he calls the police to kind of give an anonymous tip because she th- says that they're going to bomb the Stockholm flight. Yeah. Um, and he calls it that in as like a bomb warning, saying that they won't be able to trace it. But you know, a couple of hours later, the police turn up <laughs> at their door. They're like those um, police officers. The one especially just looks like I don't know. He's just wearing a vest and a. <laughs> <laughs> a pair of jeans and stuff. I don't know. They were so weirdly, weirdly casual for police officers, <laughs> like, especially when they're like, "Do you want some gazpacho?" And they're like, "Well, you know, we're on the job, but yes, I definitely do want some." Gazpacho. I do like the scene though, where the handyman and the police officers like they share each other, show each other their um, credentials or you know their their ID badges. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> um, uh, where are we? This plot is so complicated, and um. To the point, actually, it took me a while to kind of it would sink in. I was at the end. I was kind of like, I need to watch this again because it's all just like bouncing around, and I'm not totally like, sure. If we what, thought like, Ruthless people had a, a plot yeah. that was like all over <laughs> the is... shop, this is even it's ten times. So basically, we've all figured out. We're all at the apartment at the end. The police have turned up, and also who turns up is Carlos's mom. And Carlos's mom has been all over the film, but not really in it at all. And she has been like, um, she was Ivan's ex who then got put into a mental institute after he broke up with her. I think that's right. Yeah, the first introduction to her is you see her with like, she's putting a wig on and she obviously lives with her parents. Yeah, she lives with her parents. That scene's wonderful when her mum's moaning about the hat. And saying, why does your dad buy these ridiculous clothing? And then the next scene you see her mum wearing that stupid hat walking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> that made me properly made me laugh. Um and uh her dad's really weirdly dolting to her, like treats her like a child as well. I think that's kind of important to her yeah, character. Yeah, definitely. Somehow like um yeah, she turns up with this wild wig, like big hair wig, um pink like like Chanel suit kind What's of thing. What's called like a beehive? Is it like one of those kind of? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Um, but like, obviously, a wig. It's trying to be a wig. You know, it's not trying to pretend it's not. Um, and like big, big pink suit, and she's done her eye makeup. Like no one's ever done eye makeup before. It's like to the point that Carlos even says to him, his mom, like, "You're scaring me," because she's like drawn on her eyelashes on her face like and <laughs> and she's got like big she's drawn like under her eyes these big big black like lines that are kind of don't blend in very well they're like they don't they kind of leave like a gap between her eyes and the eye makeup it felt really purposeful that she was like mad you know like they're, they're, they're making her seem like unhinged to the point actually i was like i was like if john waters made this oh, that would be a drag yeah. queen uh, yeah, like 100%. that would be like divine playing that role, like and yeah, like in hairspray she, or whatever. Like yeah, 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 totally. Like she, she, she comes to the apartment dragged up, you know. Like she basically. went like a big baby pink kind of like yeah, yeah, is it pink. Yeah, is it? yeah, it is. It is. Or pink. is it it's blue? Really, it's pink. It's pink, definitely. And it's like it's like loud and big shouldered and kind of like, um, and she basically waits for everyone to fall asleep. She's realised that the thing up with the kind of um, gazpacho, doesn't she? So she waits yeah. for everyone to fall asleep, and when she does, she robs the cop's gun, and um, she points it at like Pepper, and um, she says that she faked being sane because she was watching the insane asylum. She watched a f- dubbed film, and she realised Ivan was, was sleeping not. with her because of the way they acted the, on screen together yeah, yeah. in the dubbing <laughs> with their voiceovers. Yeah, their voiceovers. So she pretended to be sane to get out of the insane asylum, so she could kill like Ivan. Basically. There's a lot of action um, in this film that happens off screen, isn't it? It's all yeah, that's, just, a lot. <laughs> that's what I was saying. Like it's it's like a low budget film, but with a big kind of plot on the periphery on the outside of it that kind of 
all accumulates inside this apartment, doesn't it? I mean, it's... I'm not surprised that they've made stage adaptions of this. Oh, like, yeah. It's, you... it's incredibly You'd stagey. Probably... And... You could think it was a stage show before. Yeah, them, yeah. You know what I mean? Definitely. And it worked. You could easily do that. It would work so easily. Like, well, they, um, I think they even planned to do a re- like a American movie remake, which you, you'd have thought they would have done, but thankfully I'm they didn't. utterly surprised they haven't done that, yeah. frankly. Utterly Especially surprised. in like, the late 80s, 90s, they were, they were yeah. dead set on remaking every... Yeah, movie. yeah. And this was a huge film. hit. I mean, it like did it win or did it just get um, nominated for Best Foreign Language? I don't know I if can't, it... I don't think it won. I think it just got nominated. Um... um it won yeah, at the Venice so. Film Festival. Oh, cool! Well Baftas. <laughs> it was nominated for Best uh, Foreign Language Film. Uh, it won the New York Critics. Academy Awards. It was Critics just nominated. Golden Globes. It was just nominated. But but still good though. I mean, still. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, New York Film Critics. It won Best Foreign Language Film. Yeah. And runner at Best Actress for Carmen Mirra. Yeah. Carmen Mirra is so good in this film. Yeah, she's um, really good. So yeah, that that's when it's that's when Pepper realizes that he's flying to Stockholm somehow. She kind of just pieces it all together, doesn't she? That what's going on, and um, so that's when Lucia she she darts off to the airport to kill um to kill Ivan, and uh, this shot when she commandeers that bike, um. Another like bit part. That's like the girl that lives downstairs who they keep running past all the time, or she lives over the hall or something, because it's her boyfriend that they rob the bikes from. Uh, who she keeps her just appearing now and again. <laughs> but yeah, that that shot when she jumps on the back of that um, uh... that bike, and then they jump in Mambo taxi to to chase them, and she's in the kind of car with her that that girl that lives across the hall at that point, like. It's so good. <laughs> That's a shot I can't get out of my head. Like it's just, just her. It's gone. like about twenty seconds long. Is it the close up of her hair <laughs> just just wildly yeah. flailing in the wind? It's amazing. Yeah. It's so good. And it's like I, I said to you, like it's proper like Wick, Wicked Witch of the West. Like, it's kind of like as you're watching, you think, okay, this is gonna cut now, and you think, oh, it's too <laughs> it long doesn't... now. They should have cut <laughs> yeah. this already. But then it comes back around. And go, no, this is the perfect length. <laughs> just yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> This is exactly what it should be. All ahead, and it just probably you could probably like just see it as this kind of like I honestly drag performance. Like it is, like it's just like wild, like kind of like emotions going everywhere, kind of thing, and this madcap kind of chase. And I and they burst through the security airport, and I laughed so much at her. She when she sees Ivan, um, she slowly puts her big glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> that really yeah. made me laugh. Like, <laughs> like she gets out of a handbag and puts these massive glasses on and, and aims the gun at them. But at the last it's, minute, Pepper comes in and kind of. It's chucks. so. I, like, I love the pacing of it, though, because it's so yeah. slow. It's so slow. <laughs> yeah, like, it's so slow. She's like, ah, how am I going to stop her from shooting him? I know, I'm going to wheel this <laughs> trolley over to her. But when she wheels it with great force, it literally. Yeah, it doesn't even touch her, and she, like. <laughs> <laughs> she flies yeah, yeah it's like it's like it's i always so remember good. watching the dark knight there's a bit where like um the school bus comes in and like runs over or hits one of the joker's henchmen yeah if you watch it it's a good 10 feet away from him <laughs> obviously safety reasons but it's so blatantly obvious that this bus does not hit the henchman it's like this with this little trolley it is nowhere near her <laughs> And I was just <laughs> laughing so hard at that. But I think that was on purpose as well. It feels purposeful. The whole yeah. thing feels set up to just be, you know, just heightened everything. It's like, how you know? does he know? How does Ivan... Because Ivan goes, oh, thank you for saving my life. It's like, how do you know? Like, how, <laughs> how have you, you put that, that together? Yeah. <laughs> how have you worked that out? How have you even worked out that someone should kill you? Like, how have you, how have you put everything together at this It's point? probably because he thinks the world revolves around him. So he just, I don't know. Yeah, it's probably true. That's. I wish that was kind of the first time you saw him, though it isn't because like he appears yeah, at like, he the gets phone the, box, doesn't he, and stuff. Yeah, his phone box, and he, to get the to get his suit, his briefcase or suitcase. Yeah, or when if that's when like you kind of he sees like he sees Lucia kind of marching down the street, doesn't he? Yeah. He hides in the phone box because he's a useless, useless character. It's uh, it's that's basically the end. As I say, like it, like I think in a lesser movie, it would end at the airport with like a still shot, like a kind of 
like pours on like you know pepper or something but it doesn't it takes her back to her apartment and that's when she she sees the, like you know everyone asleep in the apartment antonio banderas has got his arms all around her best friend like and and she goes and greets marisa on the kind of um on the veranda and they have that kind of slow chat and like little moment of trying to tranquility and it's just like this is this is great like this is this is great the whole film's great <laughs> that's that's my summary <laughs> but no yeah i agree with you i thought it was a fantastic film i, re- I really enjoyed it i, I didn't know what two I thumbs to up I didn't from know me. what to expect <laughs> two thumbs up <laughs> and it was it was a wild success it really was um and i can i can see why it translated I really can. It's it's really really easy to watch, and the best thing, all it's under ninety minutes. Oh which yeah, is amazing. Gotta love those under ninety minutes. It just feels like one of those old comedies, you know. Like I've been watching quite a lot of Preston Sturges recently, and it feels like one of those old kind of like classic studio comedies, but it's full with like you know Spanish characters. Now these are these are not American women; these are Spanish women, and it's proud of it, you know. And it's it's part of all that language and culture and look and and you know madrid and everything like that is all always baked into the film i can understand why he why he had such an impact on you know spain and and at the time because it's so quintessentially to me anyway quintessentially spanish you know Mm. just just what i what i think of almost when i think of like spanish stuff is seems to be in these films in the same way that I think you can say that about British filmmakers, some British filmmakers as well. Like, it just seems to kind of grab that culture or grab that kind of time or something really well. And, um, well, like Ken Loach or I don't know. Yeah, Ken Loach is kind of what I was thinking of. So, like, feels quintessentially kind of English. I'd Maybe kind of, in this. I'd like to say Danny Boyle, but I think most of his films aren't set in. The UK. No, they're not. <laughs> Maybe Millions is the only one that is. No, well, Train Spying. <laughs> Shallow oh, grave. true. Yeah, that's true. Um, I guess the twenty eight. Kind of like later, but, um, you know, like like kind of the archers back in like the forties and stuff like that. This yeah, that just something that grabs that kind of culture. This feels like it with Amadova. I can, and it's that's really fun for me to watch. Basically, that's like really interesting. Me. That's why I've you know I've gone on a little binge. I watched like so I watched Women on the Verge of of the Nervous Breakdown. I watched Time Me Up, Time Me Down, and I watched All About My Mother as well. Um, nice. Just to kind of like I, you know, I'm now interested in this. I want to, I want, I want to see more, really. And um, it's been great. I really, really enjoyed exploring his films, really. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna. Te- I'm definitely this week gonna watch Time Me Up, Time Me Down. It looks great. You should. Just, just look. I think you'd like it. Yeah, and uh, we apologise, um, Pedro, if we butchered your name. Oh, oh I know. I've pe- butchered it a thousand times. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's so embarrassing to talk out loud. But Icon, and I really need to watch Pain and Glory. I need to watch Pain and Glory. I meant to watch it in 2019, and I know it was big kind of Oscar play and everything like that, and I just didn't get around to it, and I need to watch that. I think at the time, it could still be, I don't know, but it was the highest grossing Spanish film of all time, and wow. it's the most successful Spanish film in America. But I don't know if wow. that's still I can the believe case, that. but it could still be. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I get, again, I. What else is there, really? There's not. I don't think I a lot so. of Spanish film gets breaks into Hollywood, really. I'd say you get a lot of Spanish language stuff coming yeah. from like South America or Mexico, but I don't, you don't get so much stuff coming from Europe. I think it's not a huge. It's I don't want to say, it's not a huge international film kind of country. Do you know? Like I'm sure there are tons of Spanish filmmakers working in Spain, but for some reason they don't seem to kind of get out there as much i mean the the two i've watched recently are the platform which is about Mm. the this is kind of like i wouldn't say like a horror film but it's kind of like a a, like one of those high concept kind of films where i don't have you seen it i i remember it i haven't watched it but it's where like there's like many levels and there's like a platform that goes through the middle of each one of these levels and it's got like food on it and it kind of the food gets less and less and less as it goes down the levels okay um, okay there's that uh, i've watched veronica which i think was a um oh, veronica, i think it's yeah. like a an exorcism horror film isn't it yeah. yeah and i mean there's plenty of films with um 
Penelope Cruz. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, Good wreck as well. Was wreck is wreck Spanish or is that? I feel like wreck is Mexican. <laughs> is it? <laughs> I could. I, maybe it's not. Maybe it is Spanish. I think wreck is. No, it is Spanish. You're right. Yeah, it is Spanish. Yeah. So there are definitely some. There are. There is stuff. Was the original Villa Sky Spanish? Ooh, I think it might be actually. I think it might be. What was the original called? Open your eyes. Yes. Yeah, that's well. It says Spain, France, Italy, but it's it's, it's in Spanish language. Yeah. And like Inaratu is is Mexican, isn't he? As well, we should cut this out. This is embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> But it seems that <laughs> Spanish film is definitely like on the on the up. Cool. I in would like of, to watch more, frankly. Yeah, like, definitely. I, I want to be, you know, the whole point of this is I want to, I want to know more, you know, I want to see more and stuff. Like, and this is the first Spanish language film we've done on this podcast. So yeah. Like, like um, there's definitely room for us to do more. Cool. So, uh, what are we talk about next time. Uh, we're we're going from one icon to another. This is the double icon week because if if this is the most important Spanish film of the eighties, then I think the most important like you know black film, African American film of the eighties is is gonna be. Uh, uh, <laughs> I can't. Remember what it's called it's to do the right thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, I'm gonna start that again. We're going. We're going from icon to icon. That's what we're doing. Um, and we're going right from Spain, from Madrid to New York with Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. Oh, I've, I, I am really looking forward to watching yeah, this. Yeah, Sam, I've been whole, like, you know, it's been a blind spot on my, you know, for me for like years and years and years. Yeah. And when we decided to do this, this is like a no brainer to do this film. So we've just been yeah. waiting a year and a half now just to. It feels like it. This is it. one of the first films that was on the docket for us to do. And I just feels like I've been waiting to watch it for ages now. <laughs> and hopefully, all being well, if schedules align, we'll have our first like proper movie uh, critic joining us called Zaki Hassan. So hopefully, he'll be joining us, but we'll see. That'd be really fun. Yeah, yeah. that'd be really cool. Cool. So, yeah, uh, thanks very much for listening. And uh, please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on whatever you listen to us on. Uh, yeah, don't forget you can reach out to us on Twitter. We are at Adjust Your Track. That's with a YR, not a your. And yeah, don't forget, if the pitch is bad, always adjust your tracking. Ah, oh, fucking nailed that. <laughs>